the record came out and the fir- one of the first people that was on our face was Tommy Lee and he was like dudes <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Sincast, presented by CinemaSins. All right, everybody, welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from CinemaSins, joined as always by the voice of CinemaSins, Jeremy Scott. Hello! And from Music Video Sins, Barrett Share. Hi, everyone. Today we have a very special guest with yes. us today. Woo. It's very exciting. Uh, from the band self in the, and uh, currently composer of Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles yep. uh, on Nickelodeon, yep. we have Matt Mahaffey here. Matt Mahaffey. <laughs> in studio. In right, studio. Baby. That's right. <laughs> uh, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me. Uh, uh, I, I, it was uh, surprising to see... That you were the composer of this of this show that has sort of skyrocketed, right? Nickelodeon was quick too. Nickelodeon has what they can't currently have twenty six episodes in one season, right? Yeah. And they immediately ordered another twenty six. Like they did before it even aired. Yeah, wow. no, seriously. Which I don't know how that really works. Corp- corporatically yeah <laughs> you know i guess they just saw it and were like this is gonna be cool yeah. let's roll the die i don't i don't know how it works but i was really happy i actually just got like um maybe two days ago i just got the email of like hey we're officially going but it's like i find out via instagram like <laughs> oh, <laughs> holy crap. Can, can you curse <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely yeah so it's like i find out on my phone like oh my god <laughs> yeah okay yeah wow. so it's a lot it's um 11 minutes of scoring each week yeah. You know, because they, they butt two together. That makes 22 minutes and you have room for commercials to make a half hour show. So you just get blank, you know, you just get dialogue and some temp sound effects and um, just go, go. You, know. so you don't wow. you don't even get anything visually to work with? No, I get visual. Yeah. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I get, I mean, um, it's usually a locked picture. Okay. When okay. I get it. Sometimes Good. it's not. And when it's not, that's a pain in the ass. Okay. Like, yeah. It's just like, mm-hmm. we cut a couple of frames here. Fuck. Because <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. are you going by like... When you see uh, when like the National Symphony or any symphony plays along with a score or something mm-hmm. like that, they've got like the timeline and all that stuff. Is that how you work, um, recording wise? Yeah, I mean it is. It's such a fast pace that um, you. I just take. I'll watch the whole episode. It's not like I can sit there and John Williams and Danny Elfman and be like, "Well, that's going to be the love theme." I'll work, <laughs> I'll work on that first. <laughs> yeah. You know, I can sometimes if if um, there's a new character. Mm-hmm. For instance, like uh, Lena Headey from uh, Cer- you know she's Cersei, uh-huh. mm-hmm. she's a she's a giant spider. So I'm like, okay, she's <laughs> got this big episode. So I'm like, okay, I'll work out a theme for each villain, which right. is really fun. Yeah, yeah, you know, kind of kind of John Williamsy, like something declamatory for for Perrin Draxum. You know, that's that's <laughs> what I love doing. But um, the way that this is super nerdy, but the way Pro Tools works is that you have to tempo map everything out. So each mm-hmm. each cue that I do is a different tempo, and if I go, you know. Eight minutes in, and I have a BPM of 87. If I go, okay, I'm going to start at the beginning now, and this is going to be a 190 BPM, it takes everything off the timeline. There's no way to lock it because it's oh. all MIDI. There's no audio files at this point. This is 140 tracks of just you know huge sample libraries because mm. we don't have the budget to go in and be like, well, all right, let's get the string players in there and let's yeah. hire the choir. <laughs> <laughs> Bring them in now. All right, you're done. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> It's all software, so like I have this choir that uh, just has Word Builder, and I'll type in pizza, and I'll be like, pizza! Oh, that's you awesome. know? <laughs> so <laughs> it's like you, you find ways to cut corners. Yeah. And this show is so schizophrenic. Um, when you have nothing, like I don't have a giant database of cues, when you hear the, the, the show, it just hops stylistically all over the place, and that is written in real time. No, it's oh, like, wow. It's not like, here's a bunch of rock stuff I wrote, and here's a bunch of like Star wars stuff that I wrote, and I'll just pop that in. No, it's it's actually a piece of music mm. that is written like that. And the, and the template is is designed to where I can be like, I need a beat machine. I have all my beat machines. I need you know a, um, a horn section or woodwinds. They're all there. And I just click around and t- uh, I feel a flute, and then I lay a flute in. Oh, this has got to be some, you know, Romanian death metal or something. You have right. to just do that, you know. It's um, that's it's it's you have to like reprogram your brain to do that, right? Well, it's. I mean, I think it's the perfect job for me because my my music's always been a little ADD right. with like, <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> I think yeah. I want the bridge to sound like Depeche Mode, yeah. you know, <laughs> in the middle of a Nirvana song. So uh, it, it kind of works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I didn't, you know, it's not something that. You know, film and, and composing to picture, 
it's not something that you just wake up one day and, you know, you're not born with like, ah, you know, I mean, I remember watching cartoons when I was a kid and thinking um, that the music was insane. Like, just mm -hmm. like, God, how, how do humans do that? You know, it was so good yeah. because that was before sound effects and a lot of the crashes of the cymbals were when, you know, they'd, they'd crash into stuff. So yeah, and like, they weren't using MIDI back then either. Were they? No, they weren't. <laughs> they weren't, but... You go back and listen to Bugs Bunny, and there's lots of tape looping going on. Oh, just, yeah. You know, lots of splicing, lots of people cutting tape. It's crazy, <laughs> man. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and it's amazing because it's pretty constant, right? Like, th throughout the episode, there's very rarely, like, a, a, a moment without score, right? Yeah, I mean, it. It it's – this show is so, again, schizophrenic. It's just the – the that's very funny. The jokes are so fast. Yeah. The cutscenes are so fast. So we spot, we spot um, on Skype every week. You know, we'll we'll just sit there and we'll go through the episode and we'll talk about what we what kind of music we would like for each cue, and then I'll get the episode and I'll look at my notes and it'll be like, okay, John Carpenter. There's all these, <laughs> all these references, and then I'll get into it like, I'm okay, I'm gonna do that, and then we want some of this over here, we want some spaghetti western right here, and then I realize like that's like a 10 second span. Oh. I, just, I just went <laughs> bing, bong, bong, bong. <laughs> and it's absolutely mental. So I have to just kind of like, all right, pick the best idea and just kind of stretch that out and then tell them like, Hey, that didn't work. Or, um, you know, <laughs> they, they give me so many notes that are all good ideas and I want to incorporate them and keep everyone happy. The writers, the producers. And, um, but then I'll turn in the score and they're like, this is absolutely mental schizophrenia. And it's like, but that's what, <laughs> You're using all of our notes? I'm like, yeah, because you told them to me and I did it. <laughs> that's, uh, that's something I noticed watching uh, an episode of, uh, of of Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is just like how the range of music that's going on in through the entire episode mm -hmm is exactly what you're talking about because you know it i mean they have to pack a lot in the 22 minutes yeah yeah and it's like you know oh they're being funny here oh this is semi-serious or yeah, you know yeah, that yeah. you know and so there's a lot of like and then there's upbeat action and then there's like we're back down again and we're you know right i mean I'm, it's it, scoring is a process and it's not it's just something you have to kind of learn that you are serving the story you know it's not about you juggling it's just about serving the story and um, me showing off a bunch of styles is not going to impress any kid that's watching it. It's more about like, did I serve the story? So I'm, I'm about 20, 30, 25 episodes in. And, um, so I'm, I'm learning to just be like, all right, just step back or, or just keep it a little more thematic. So it's not so doesn't sound like somebody just throwing records at the, yeah. at the show, you know? Right. Uh, this is amazing. Anybody that hasn't seen the show, it's it's almost it'll remind you of Spider Man into the Spider Verse, mm -hmm. which I haven't seen yet. It, it, it that's an amazing movie. <laughs> yeah, I know we've, I'm that close to watching it. <laughs> and also after you see that very different movie, but see us, that's a really oh yeah movie. no that's on the list. I, I chose Gentleman Broncos for the tenth time. Oh, <laughs> you can't go wrong with that. <laughs> so good, but it's it's a really amazing the way that they they format it is very much like in Spider Verse. It looks like a comic book. It's mm. got like the the wordplay yeah. on there, and it is gorgeous. And they've stylized all the different turtles dramatically different than what you've ever seen before. Raphael's this big hulking figure now, and like Donatello's this l literal like gearhead and everything. Mm -hmm. It's a really cool show. What was cool to me is, because I had seen, I've got an 11-year-old son, so I had seen the first couple of episodes. Um, he's in, into Turtles. Awesome. But I watched it again and really paid attention to the, the music. Yeah, you need headphones. And that's a weird, that's a weird way to watch a cartoon, actually. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. uh, I've actually, I, I saw the symphony a long time ago. They did like a Looney Tunes uh, thing. Wow. And hearing that music without the visual aid is like anxiety inducing. Yeah. Like, it's like, dun, dun. Yeah, it's, it's nuts it's nuts like you you get to a point where you're like i don't even know what time signature this is because there, there can't be one you know yeah. um it, it's weird because you you do get it's you know i'm doing i think the best work of my life so far on this show like sonically like just uh creatively but you get buried under sound effects and the sound mm -hmm. effects guy is so good but i mean it's like you hear every little squeak of a jacket and every dink of an eye <laughs> and i've got like well where'd my woodwinds go you know it's gonna be it's like ben burt and you know <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. sound effects guy just <laughs> battling it out john williams and ben burt like just like <laughs> fuck you fuck you well i was i was a big fan of the original well i guess it was the original uh saturday morning cartoon 
I uh, used to watch that all the time, and I don't know if there was some other history involved with that. Either that was the first one or the second iteration. That was the first cartoon. I think it was a comic book before Well, that. I know it was a comic book, but yeah. they've had several iterations of, yeah, yeah. of animated series. And uh, the one that I watched was late 80s or whatever. Mm-hmm. And being a fan of that theme song, but <laughs> what you guys did with it, is amazing it's yeah. like it, it's usually you come you just compare that original to that and this one's actually way more catchy i guess yeah. catchier well it uh, was it was a, a year it took to write that 30 seconds wow. um, because the original one's a minute 30 seconds so there's all the time in the world to just be like we're turtle dudes <laughs> 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 we're cruising for you <laughs> You know, whereas we're like, can you please tell the entire story of the Ninja Turtles in 30 seconds? And we were like, uh, you know, and, <laughs> Mikey, Ralph, all the And fun. then, like, we turned it in, and, and they were actually just like, uh, actually, uh, Raph's the leader now. So we, we don't have any information. Uh. And we're like, oh, okay, well, that changes everything. We'll just redo. <laughs> so it was this process of, like, um, just trying to cram it all in. And I think we did it. And um, they were fans of Wired All Wrong, so that's why oh, really? it's very oh, wow. Wired All Wrong ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in the way it sounds. Yeah, it was like <laughs> nutty, man. Yeah, it's nice to go back to that, that theme because you, you do get that nostalgia ding and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then I mean, you can hear very they, much uh, Matt Mahaffey yeah. type of thing. Yeah, they wanted, they wanted that. And then I just didn't realize how far this stuff reached. Like it's been around 35, 36 years. Yeah. It was a little past my time, so mm-hmm. I didn't really get into it when I was a kid. So. Luckily, Tish, my girlfriend, who who co-wrote the theme song with me, she wrote the lyrics. Um, just she's a big turtle fan, so she was like, "We're gonna take a day. We're gonna order pizza. And we're gonna go through edi- every edi- every iteration." <laughs> awesome. Are you talking about uh, Letitia Wolf? Yeah, yeah. Okay, from right. the Dead Dead. Yeah. So, oh, well. so we just watched every single version. I was like, "Oh, okay. So he's like, he's an asshole. He's you know whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the protagonist. He's the whatever." You didn't play that NES game though, did you? That Nintendo game. Tell I, me you didn't. She didn't make you play that game. No, we didn't play the games. Okay, we good. Because that, that you was, didn't like that game. Wait, was it the second one of the Nintendo? Which was the one that had you side scrolling underwater and you kept getting zapped by the electroshock? I'm oh, pretty sure that was the NES. One. That was that the game one. can kiss my that, ass. That, that was just one level. Though. The, <laughs> the yeah, well, no, I don't all, care. All of those games were hard. If you play, if you played the arcade version of it, that game was just that game was just built to Constant. store quarters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <man>. Constantly <laughs> attack. Constantly. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, how long does it take to to make this eleven minutes for an episode? Um, it depends. I get a week. Mm-hmm. So, oh, you what? get a week. I wow. get a week. Yeah, really. So you, you, they want you to to get the score done, and then they come out with the episode like two weeks later or something like that. No, it's 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 um. There's a lot of processes, um, obviously, but I they I we basically spot it and we say like we want this, we want that. I go in and I start working on it, and then I turn it in, um, in like six days, and then we we have another Skype session. And they're just kind of like, yeah, we didn't like this, we didn't like that. So I go through and I revise. So there's a revising score. Mm-hmm. And then I turn that in. And then just the process to the mix is pretty gnarly because we have to do lots of stems. We have mm-hmm. to stem out every instrument. And not only that, there's so much music um, that I have to checkerboard the stems within Pro Tools. So that's a whole day of just editing just to tie it up in a bow to send it. You know? Wow. Um, See, people don't realize, I don't think, how much... Like technical work like that goes into doing score. I well, think they just see musician making music, but there's a lot more work to it. Well, there's and then there's tons of that's just that's just getting the actual music out. After that process, um, then there's creating the cue sheets. So you have to go through if it's just a tiny little two second, or if it's a thirty second chase scene, that has to be IPI'd. It has to be titled. Wow. It has to be registered every single piece. Wow. So. We have to go through each episode. Once the mix is done, I see what they've used, what they've not used, and we check that, and we write the cue names for each one, each tiny piece of music. There'll be 70 pieces. Wow. Wow. And then that gets that has to get approved by Viacom, and then <laughs> they say, okay, we approve, and then, then it has to be put into a system called Q. Now, you go into Q, and you type in the – they pre-populate Q with your Q titles – and sometimes you, you have to type it in and, be, and hope that your cue is there. Sometimes it's not. So that's a process of like, hey, I'm not finding this one at time code this or that or this. Oh, my God. So oh that's God. a week of work of just just registering it all. Yeah. And that's for each episode. And, and between – I have two composers that work for me. And between the three of us, we're doing almost – we're doing six shows. So there's 
Wow. When we wake up, the emails from these companies are just to the yeah. floor of like, where's the cue sheets for this? We need final mix for this. Wow. So it's just a lot. It's more like clerical work. So we're having to like, we've got it all humming now, but it was like in order to, to get, to get paid, you have to do all these processes and they have to be spot spotless. So it's really And then you wild. have to find time for the actual creative, right? To actually like sit down and yeah, then, then you're just like, once you go through a process of doing all that, you're just like, and now I got to write more. Yeah. Things, you know? <laughs> I was going to say, it's, it starts to sound like a full-time job. Like how do it you have time for, job. I guess you have to be pretty intentional about carving out time for other interests and pursuits, right? Well, there's just not, I mean, I'm a dad, so that's, oh, wow. it's yeah. either, um, and I'm not doing it all myself. I have a great team. We're called Cake and Space, oh, yeah. and we're kind of having to form. You know, we're kind of having to form this and and get it going with Letitia and Marcus Meston, Kiefer, and Fantino, and we um we just have breakfast. You know, like you guys, we just have a meeting. and We go like, okay, let's go, and we go and we <laughs> go to our screaming studios, at each other's faces. Ah, let's go. <laughs> so it is. It takes a village to, yeah. to do this. But if I'm not doing that, then I'm I'm dadding. Okay. You know. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. How did you get uh, hooked up with with Nickelodeon? Because you had done Henry Hugga Monster, right? The, mm-hmm. the music for that. Mm-hmm. How did the Nickelodeon connection materialize? Um, my my story begins with self being signed to DreamWorks Records, right? And through that, they had the animation department in Glendale, and then they had the the you know the Spielberg part, mm-hmm. the the movie, the live action movie stuff. So I basically they would call their artists in to screen films. They would just be like, yo, you're an artist on our label. We want to get your song in the film. Come screen it. I was like, great. And the first thing that I screened was like a rough cut of Shrek. Oh, and nice. like Jeffrey Katzenberg came out and there was like maybe 10 of us in this in the little DreamWorks theater. Wow. And he's like, okay, well, you're going to see some pencil drawings. You're going to see some finished stuff. It's a little wonky, but you know, here's what we're looking for. So my, I was just to replace All Star by Smash Mouth. They were like, this song's been used a thousand times. <laughs> yes. Even at that point. Yes. It had been used every It was year. in every trailer. It was. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. And this was 1999 at this point, right? Yeah. Or 2000? Yeah. So, wow. so I was like super jazzed. I wrote the song that weekend. Um, this is I, Stay Home? Stay Home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they were, they were like, um, we love it. This is great. So I went and worked with Eric Valentine, who actually produced All Star. And um, we spent a weekend and I went up to Palo Alto and we set it to picture and all this stuff. And then at the last second, um, Jeffrey Katzenberg was like, where's the all-star song when he, when he heard the song? <laughs> of, course, in there. of course he was. So it got moved to the end credits. <laughs> but anyway, like at least working on that film, I met so many people in animation that they were like, we really like what you do. Would you score some stuff for like a Walmart companion CD or, and then it got to where I was scoring like the bonus footage for the Shrek movies as they kept coming out. Cause it was so popular. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, I recreated the thriller video. I did the, you know, far, far away idol, spoofing American idol, all these things and met people that did episodic stuff mm-hmm. for Disney and Nickelodeon. So doing that, they're like, would you ever do episodic television? And I was not really into it at the time cause I was trying to be an artist. And, um, but then once I realized that I really liked working the picture, I reached out to those people and they reached out to me and I started just working on, uh, the first thing I did was a, a, a Mandarin version of Dora the Explorer called Nihao Kai Lan. Oh, is that what that is? Wow. <laughs> and it didn't work very well because, uh, you know, Mandarin has like five tones and they're not like la 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> so like, so these kids are going to sing in Mandarin and these, and the cast was little kids. So, um, it was really difficult. We'd have a linguist on the phone. <laughs> and she's on the phone you know it's like you know how when you have those those meetings where someone's on a phone and it's sh- so she's yeah. like you know the word for, the mandarin word for snow is shit so like, and these kids are, i'm trying to get these kids to sing. No, no. So it's a phone going shit and these kids are going shit yeah. <laughs> oh god but I, the people that worked on that show uh were all they all went on to do great things um Chris Nee created Doc McStuffins. Oh, nice. <clears throat> and Sasha Palladino created Miles from Tomorrowland, but he also worked on Henry Huggle Monster. So ah. meeting Sasha, working with him, um, he was like, hey, I'm in Ireland. You want to do the music for this show? And that was Henry Huggle Monster. Ah. And then, um, yeah, just spearheaded from that. Sanjay and Craig I did. Um, and then I do Nella the Princess Night, which is, it's just you meet, you know, it's just people that, you know, people people make these things, human beings, and you meet them, and it's like, I like working with you. It's like Tim Burton and Danny Elfman, like, yeah. I don't need to change it, it ain't broke, you yeah, know, yeah. Like, let's just keep doing this. <laughs> so I've been really lucky to, to be able to to, to work, um, to, to learn how to score, and and people appreciate it, and I, I love scoring animation, it's mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. Do you uh, have any 
desire to go towards live action or anything like that? Yeah, or? man. I mean, I sci-fi. You know, I just want. Oh, yeah? I'd love to score sci-fi. It's just um, animation's what's happening, and honestly, it's so much quicker. Yeah. And, and with the turtles, like they'll blast into outer space, and I'll get to do a sci-fi scene, then I'll go back to the lair or whatever. It's, yeah. it's, it's got it all. So yeah, yeah. it's really rewarding show nice. to do. That's awesome. Is uh, is is Cake in Space uh, currently just on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or are there other titles that they're doing at the at the time, or does that just take up so much time? Um, well, I mean, we're doing all these shows simultaneously between three guys. So, okay, yeah, yeah it's gotta so be we're insane. Constantly. Yeah, just passing stuff off like we need a new thing for this, so we'll just, you know, we'll compose. We'll, it's it's nuts, man. <laughs> yeah, I imagine so. It's nuts, but we're we're all oh, we're doing Transformers rescue bots too. Which oh is yeah, like, yeah, Transformers for kids. Oh really? Yeah. That's no, awesome. yeah, rescue bots was uh, was my kids' jam. Back yeah, we're doing the whole, we're doing like a, the new season right now. That's oh, awesome. Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna blow his fucking mind when I get back up. I've already blown his mind because uh, we were watching it last night. And uh, it, your your name came up at the uh, at the end, and I was like, "Hey, I'm going to talk to that guy tomorrow." Right. He was like, "What?" <laughs> like, that's right. I had I had a I had a weird IMDb experience with that because it said uh, Matt Mahavy three episodes. I was like, "No, come on, that's not right." No, they just started airing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and it, and it's I think it's either that it's just because either they don't I don't know if they credit every episode or if it's just i don't know imdb is kind of whack and like anytime i go on there it's like somebody somebody's written my bio on there like he likes run dmc (laughs) 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 well yeah (laughs) anybody can edit that (laughs) we we know for a fact he likes yeah that's 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 the the thing that defines you it's it's just (laughs) wherever they pull like you know your bio from it's clearly from someone that barely knows <laughs> what my bio is <laughs> well stay home was a big moment for uh self right um yeah because it was it was funny like i think i just moved to la and that was the first time i'd written for a film and uh, it was the only original song written for the film so they had to say like Please, you know, consider this for the Oscars. And I was like, I'm, awesome. wal- I'm waltzing into the Oscars. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I'm up That's against it. Paul McCartney. And I was like, no, you're not going to go anywhere near that. <laughs> I love that song, though, because... That was my introduction to self. Was that oh, song? Oh, that's so weird. That's so I'm weird. sorry. Well, it's it's true. I got the soundtrack because this was when I was working at Hollywood 27, and uh-huh. I got the soundtrack as just the studio had sent a few of them as promotional things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm listening to it. That was the song that grabbed me the most, and then I started exploring the rest of your. Wow, man! Well, I appreciate one. that. And I didn't listen to any of that smash mouth, smash mouth bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mouth mouth. <laughs> yeah. That, those guys, I actually played keyboards on a on a Smash Mouth record, and um, it was it was really fun. Greg Camp, the guy who writes all the music, is really really brilliant, dude. But um, the record came out, and they'd misspelled my name, so it's not in any of my my. Um, oh, stuff. wow. <laughs> It's like Matt Mahane. Yeah, Matt Mahane. <laughs> it's like I'm I'm used to it, man. You should see my mail. It's like McCafferty. Mac- <laughs> you, know, Mac- you, you uh you also toured with Beck, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that wow. must have been awesome. That was awesome. That was really cool. Does he have can you talk to that guy? Like he's I get the feeling that he's probably a lot more normalish in person to person conversation than his persona or his aura would suggest because he kind of has this reputation of being like a really weird dude mm. uh, especially yeah. back in the day well he yeah. had, i mean well, he put out an album a couple of years ago that was all sheet music <laughs> yeah. um yeah. but i imagine i've always had this <laughs> feeling right. like you can kind of have a regular conversation with the dude yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and absolutely. he's like he's one of those he can play a lot of different instruments too right yeah he's 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 just really um I don't know. He's like a Spielbergian and, and that's a terrible, I know that that's not a good um, analogy, but the fact that someone can just like wrangle things, you know? Yeah. Um, Different genres and instrumentation. And and just on the fly, off the cuff, like I want to do this right now. And I think this is smart. Like I'm a drummer. So we would be, I mean, Jesus, there was a session we did it for the morning phase record at Blackbird. And you don't know what's going to happen. So look, I came in, and then Jack White came in, and then Steve Malcolmus from Pavement came in. Oh, wow. And back. This is like Million Dollar Quartet. Yeah. It's, it, it was one of those moments, dude, where it felt like, you know that like uh, the, that that picture of like uh, 
all the old famous Western guys at the bar, like an Elvis is there and they're all hanging out. I, I was just like, I'm in that picture. That's amazing. But I'm playing like, instead of playing drums or something that I'm comfortable with, um, I'm playing like this weird jazz organ that I got for 200 bucks at a pawn shop in Camden. You nice. know? So it's, and so if any, anytime I was like playing an instrument, he'd be like, go play the mandolin. You know? like, <laughs> like he really doesn't want it to sound studio musician-y huh. because if we're all in our comfort zones, it's going to sound like this really smooth thing. So he was really into shaking that up and I always appreciated that. And just crazy things of like whimsical things of like, wouldn't it be funny if you guys like had like dinner while I was doing the acoustic <laughs> bit, bit in the middle. And we were like, that'd be hilarious. <laughs> and then we, it, it ended up, we we just started jamming along and tinkering because we were just kind of bored eating salad like <laughs> in front of twenty thousand people in France. <laughs> like, and and <laughs> so we started miking up things and putting PZM mics on it, and then it became a jam session. And then we um played we're playing Saturday Night Live, and uh, it was from a previous record cycle, and you're always supposed to promote your new stuff. So uh, Beck was like, I want to do the dinner table thing, and they're like, Well, that's not your new song, so. Uh, Lauren needs to see it. So we auditioned for Lauren oh, really? on a screen. He was, you know, in a space pod somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, that is awesome. So we, we did that. Oh, my God. That's awesome. <laughs> so you yeah, he's pass. super, super cool guy, man. Really just awesome. really smart. Man. It's interesting to, to hear you say that you're – so you identify as a drummer or self-identify yeah. as a drummer first and foremost. But you play everything, right? Um, yeah, I guess I'm a polyamorous musician. <laughs> <laughs> or, <laughs> I've, uh, I mean, I've, I've seen self, you know, back in the day, um, oh. I think the most recent one was maybe the 2005 concert at X and N. Right. We redid, um, uh, yeah, we did a whole record. And, you know, I'm always used to you being the front man, either at the synth or the keyboards yeah, or the yeah. guitars or whatever. Uh, rhythm. I mean, just rhythm for yeah, me. Yeah. Like, drums are the only thing I can really jam on. Mm -hmm. I don't read music, so... Um, it's not like, it's the only thing that I could have a beer and like have fun playing. Oh yeah. Um, cause I, I can learn it's, music is like typing to me. It's like memorization. Mm -hmm. So if you like change it up half a step, I'm like, I'm lost. I have no idea <laughs> where, where I am. So I have to really, everything I do these days is from the keyboard. So I've become a much better piano player. I've played piano my whole life, but it's never been like, I've never learned how to play it. You yeah. Know? Well, that's interesting. Cause piano is all throughout all the early self stuff. Yeah. You know? But I mean, everything stems from my key. I mean, I'm the best like keyboard drummer now. You know? oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sounds like I'm killing it. You know? I'll yeah, tell you what, I, I have tried in my amateurness once or twice to do keyboard drums because mm -hmm. I have a really nice keyboard that is better than my talents. It's not easy to do keyboard drums, I'm telling you. <laughs> so That would screw me. If you're good at it, I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you some I'm tricks. impressed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finger rhythm. It's not. It's not as easy as. You, never mind. It's like that. <laughs> it's that kind of. It's that kind of party now. That's yeah. what she said. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. <laughs> um, can I ask you about Wired All Wrong? Real mm, quick? Of course. So this was uh, 2006 or so mm -hmm. that it came out. So uh, you and Jeff Terzo from God Lives Underwater mm -hmm. released this album called Break Out the Battle Tapes. Yep. Uh, which I bought at the Tower Records down on uh, on West End when it was oh, still. God rest its soul. God rest its soul. God rest. Literally, as soon as I found out, um, yeah, it was after the you, you guys had gone with DreamWorks and everything, right? And uh, and I was, he said, oh well, why are all wrongs coming out? And I was like, oh okay, I'll check that out. And I was I was blown away. The funny thing about it was, I got an edited copy with oh, all the, the curse words. Curse words cut out. Yeah, like I'm, I'm I met Jeff years ago and we'd been friends and. He was always tinkering with Wired All Wrong and um, would never let me hear anything. I don't, I don't think he was hiding it from me. He was just kind of like, ah, oh, it's not ready to be heard yet. And he was – the initial idea for it was um, he just knows so many good singers and you know, talented people. that He was like, I'm going to have somebody different sing each song. Mm. And um, I was doing self and then we, we got dropped. So I was like, why don't you let me sing on one of your tunes, you know? <laughs> And we did a song and we both were just, it was like postal service. I mean, we lived a couple oh, yeah. of miles from each other, but we were just like emailing back and forth. He'd send me a track. I'd put my little girly voice on it and send it back. <laughs> and um, we, he's like, let's do another one. And we did another one and another one. And we just kept going. And, um, you know, it's it's Jeff's crazy, mental, glitchy music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my little timber laking thing <laughs> on top of it, and we were like, "Fuck it, let's just." Mm -hmm. No, it's perfect because it's a perfect marriage of those two sounds. Because yeah. you can hear some selfish guitar, selfish, ha! selfish mm -hmm. guitar yeah. come in, like on uh, nothing at all and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, 
I was watching my favorite show, MTV's The Challenge, oh, yeah. a few years ago. This was, I think, 2010 or so. And I had already listened to the hell out of uh, Break Out the Battle Tapes, so I knew all the songs backwards and forwards. Did they use some Wired All Wrong in that? They used uh, the uh, 15 Minutes of Fame. Really? And they used uh, the L.A. song, the L.A. Um, uh, Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Yes. Well, you know, I've done a lot of those challenge theme songs. Oh, really? Yeah, a lot of the uh, – tons of those, yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. That's why I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it a bunch of It has nothing to do with the show. It's just, They're just, it's just weird it's music right. before the it thing. And, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. How do you get hooked up with that? Is this just like an opportunity that somebody goes through your just, people or whatever? Um, Bunham Murray, um, they – I started working with them years ago, um, and I remember going to their studios, and it was like literally like this – creepy dark like one light bulb swinging and a bunch of dudes just like <laughs> editing me, like golems you know and now you go there and it's like google it's, oh yeah it, they have this beautiful new campus and um, because they're just killing it with yeah. all their shows so we do two shows for them total divas and total bellas oh really Mm-hmm. You've likely seen promos for this, right? No, I haven't actually. <laughs> it follows the women of the WWE around. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, reality show. So they're either like, I don't know, he's just. I mean, I think red drapes are cool, or <laughs> <laughs> or they're in Japan beating the shit out of each other yeah. <laughs> in front of ten thousand Japanese wrestling fans. Oh, that sounds awesome. Awesome. And you're doing the music for this? Yeah, we do. Um, but that's you don't have to do that to picture. It's more. Right. Uh, it's more like um, we need. A hundred minutes of music. So we need, and each 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 piece is about a minute long. So we need like these types of beats. We need some emotional stuff. We need some comedy stuff. So we go through and just put all that together. They Mark, give you like emotional notes, basically. No, just um stylistic. Like we need stuff for them to fight to. Uh-huh. We need stuff for them to you know chill to to shop to. So it's you have this kind of like laundry list, and you kind of tick that off each week. That's uh, well, you had beats. Me- you had mentioned something about a, a note about like do something like John Carpenter or whatever in 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 the uh, Rise and and like d- how many how many movie references and directors and and composers references do you think you get in your notes every time? Um, some of them I have to just kind of write down and then Google and then study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and you kind of study the whole thing because it'll be lots of really, you know, eclectic world music and, um, you know, people that I've never heard. So mm-hmm. I'll just go through and like listen to stuff and be like, okay, those are Serto drums or, you know, those are bazookis or whatever. So I just kind of, I just kind of listen and compile the instruments mm-hmm. that are necessary to kind of recreate that. Yeah. Jesus. Uh, as fast as possible. Yeah. Your library's got to be insane, right? It's nuts. I, I've tried to make a mobile rig so I can just kind of like pop it open and travel. Mm. <clears throat> but my mobile rig is a trash can Mac pro, you know, like, <laughs> it's not like a little, la- cause it's, that's the only thing that I've found that'll power it, you know, oh, wow. that, that'll, that'll keep it from just, you know, coughing and, and just dying on me. Oh, so. Jesus. It's a lot of, lot of lot, a lot of Ram sucking software, <laughs> man, <laughs> but it's cool. Uh, what kind of movies are you into these days? Um, like I said, uh, gentlemen Broncos. Yep. 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 <laughs> That's uh, is that uh, is that uh, Jermaine Clement mm-hmm. and uh, I don't think I've ever seen the movie. You gotta yeah. see it, it's yeah. Jared, it's, Jared it's, Hess. Yeah. Okay. So he did uh, Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon Dynamite. Yeah. But Sam Rockwell is the true shining star in that film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like he's. I mean, Jermaine Clement's amazing. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um. But uh. Yeah. Sam Rockwell. Just. It's just. Um. It's just a good film, man. I don't God. know. It makes me laugh every it's, time. If it's you've seen it's it ten many, years. It's been out for ten years. I think it was it ten been? years ago that I saw. You've seen it that long. If you've seen it that many times, I may have to give that a look. Well, yeah. the first time I watched it, I didn't really dig it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I watched it again, and it, it was like Happy Gilmore for me. Like, no, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, what the fuck? Or Billy yeah. Madison? I'm sorry. Happy, oh. Happy Gilmore, I got instantaneously. Billy Madison, I did not understand the first time. <laughs> Billy yeah, Madison but, does take Billy, a couple. Yeah, of Billy times Madison was out there around. when you first. Yeah, it was the shampoo scene where he's like conditioner. I was like. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that was one of those movies. Uh, Billy, Ma- both of them actually. Billy Madison and Happy Gilmore both were my on break movies. Absolutely, so I would go and Absolutely. watch those. I I know certain parts of Billy Madison and Happy Gilmore are like the back. I leave the hair silky smooth. <laughs> yeah, yes. I go on fussy clean. <laughs> Conditioner. <laughs> no, I consider myself more of a video file than an audio file. You know, like I um I really got into home theater and I really got into just 
wanting to have the best picture possible, mm -hmm. you know, having the best sound possible. So I, and I, I love, I don't have any interest in making film or know how to direct it, but I, I love reading about it. And mm -hmm. I love like, um, I, I watch every making of almost before I watch them. I mean, I have those memorized, like mm. just watching people like Brad Bird work for yeah, the Incredibles wow. and Ratatouille. And I actually got to have lunch with that guy. I was working on a, a Shrek thing at Skywalker Ranch. And you, you, there's this commissary that's outside in this beautiful wine country. And everybody, the only the trailer for The Incredibles was out. And um, I didn't know who Brad Bird was. I didn't know. Well, yeah. I, I'd, I'd <laughs> seen The what? Iron Giant and uh -huh. everything, but um everybody had incredibles jackets on i was like i've seen the trailer you guys doing the you he's like yeah i'm mixing right now. so i had lunch with that whole team oh <laughs> my god and now that i've watched like the making of the incredibles a million times and i've just i worship brad bird now i'm like i can't believe i met all these people i probably met like joe ramft and all these oh like, people oh from yeah Pixar. yeah oh yeah and uh yeah it just blew my mind like i couldn't believe it but i i love watching that. i mean the lord of the rings Mm. making of um on the box sets like when they sweep the oscars and it, they're like it was like felt like winning the world series and mm -hmm. it was like the way they documented it it was just beautiful mm. and and i couldn't imagine like the pressure that like peter jackson would, would feel undertaking something like that so i love watching this i have no interest in doing it it's like i love you know Gordon Ramsay, but I cannot cook. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have no interest in being a celebrity chef. You know that's interesting. The Lord of the Rings is probably one of the best. It, like that behind the scenes is awards worthy itself. It's so good. It's I've it's, watched it a hundred times. It's yeah. ridiculous and, with each one of them, really. Yeah, and any any Star Wars making of that I can get my hands on, um, you know, all all that stuff. I, I love. I love all the, you know, Spielberg and Lucas. And I know that those are among film buffs. Like, that's just kind of like, oh, that's the crappy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. Like, what's, what's the book? What's the book that's about, um, you know, whoever killed, who killed Hollywood? And it's all like Spielberg and Lucas. And they're just, oh, what's uh, that book? Um, Easy Riders, Raging Bulls. That one. Yeah. yeah. I've been reading that. Yeah. yeah. That's a great book. It is a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of bands are we into? I have no idea. Are you, I'm... are you into, Music, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I say that for a reason because there, like Jeremy has said, Jeremy's uh, published a book and will publish more. Oh. Um, and he's he said that he is not a reading author, mm -mm. like you don't read a whole lot. Mm -mm. And I can imagine that there are a lot of some musicians, at least, that aren't like plugged into the current zeitgeist or that kind of thing that that don't really listen to contemporary music or or have kind of like figured out what what they like and, and kind of stick to I think that's it. probably me, you really? know. I mm -hmm. know I know what I like and I don't you know, I've, I've not really listened to Drake, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were talking about this this morning at breakfast like I've never really heard Drake, but he's a big deal. He he's sure is. Keeping mm -hmm. the lights on for some record label, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um no, I don't I mean it's if I I work really long hours mm -hmm. and you're sitting there and you're plotting away and it's just rhythm and click tracks and music. It's Probably kind of the last thing I want to do, you know. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, it's a, like, like you said, a chef that doesn't want to go home and like cook a meal for themselves, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I've just made music all day. Now I'm gonna go out and pay fifteen bucks and watch my friend dick around on guitar. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I just assume that like you and Jack White and Ben Folds were like the the stone cutters of music and you have like monthly meetings somewhere in a basement in nashville <laughs> yep. plan like where music's gonna go <laughs> where, where it's going to go <laughs> yeah. uh, i have i have random questions uh like just very random okay so how did the uh, looks and money the dave foley thing happen hmm. i've i've known dave for a long time really mm -hmm. and he just did it for to to I'll do that for you. Yeah, no <laughs> yeah, it was uh when we when we were in Chicago and a a self discussion came up. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, as I, as it does, quite as a bit. it does. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, you know, uh, we were. I was like, okay, well, what's uh, what's going on with them? And we went through YouTube and found this Dave Foley directed with Mary Lynn Rashkub in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and 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 I, I love both of those people yeah. a lot. And she's so funny. And everything. It's just a goofy I mean, everything about it is so goofy and fun and lively and they you know. they, they all donated their time. Um my manager hooked up Mary Lynn with it and um because Mary Lynn had done an online thing called Dickie. 
Mm -hmm. And um, she had used that song in that. And so my manager went to her and said, like, hey, we're going to make a music video for this. Would you be in it? She was like, totally. So she donated her time. Dave donated his time. Matt Messer from El Camino Media donated his house to film in. But yeah, everybody donated their time. And it was just like, thank you so much. It was such a cool, cool thing. Awesome. Really, really That was interesting. How many self or wired all wrong music videos have you made i don't know um the first my first exposure my first exposure to self was obviously canon mm -hmm. when they were playing it on the local radio uh 1995 it must have been i was in a driver class i was in uh driver's ed Mm. oh wow and it came on the radio and i was like wow this is really fucking good yeah and then uh i think chris and i both saw so low on 120 minutes yes and that was my first video exposure to oh okay yeah i i i had this sense of pride about that because i i I knew you made us proud i knew (laughs) i knew you guys were from tennessee and and it's and and back in the 90s i mean yeah you had country music artists and you might have a random person here and there that you didn't know about but in nashville yeah in nashville yeah yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, but that, you know, that, that to see somebody locally on MTV was a big deal mm-hmm. for me. It like, it's sort of like a, you know, Hey, there's possibilities after all, you know, <laughs> right. you know, kind you of can a, do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and I was going to MTSU during yeah. that whole period of time where you guys were just like really blowing up there and everything. And it was like, I got swept up in all that. That was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. No, it was, it was great. Um, the thing we were very proud to to ha- have a video on MTV, and so I threw a party, and um, I think it was the solo. Actually, Cannon was the first one. It was directed by Jesse Peretz, who did oh, the, yeah. the Big Me video, and he now, he oh, now yeah. I see his name on all kinds of shows. Oh yeah, He's, uh, I think the uh, Sh- Skrill Shrill. Shrill. Oh really? Okay, he's with uh, Eddie Bryant. Eddie Bryant. He's wow. directing that. Oh, wow. wow. Mm-hmm. So he's he's doing it, but um yeah, we did the Cannon video, and we really liked working with him. So we went to New York and did the solo video. And when that premiered, we like I threw a party. I had my friends. I was living in the borough, mm-hmm. and uh, we're like, "All right, here it comes." And Matt Finn was like, "All right, here's <laughs> this." And and it said, "God lives underwater." Oh, oh no! What? Oh no! And then oh. their video said, "Self." Oh, oh shit! Wow! And that's how Jeff and I initially met. Was, oh my know, god, that's hilarious! We bonded over just being like, "Yeah, man, we, yeah, we, yeah, we threw a party too." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh my god! That's the worst. Oh no! So if you liked my song, you bought his record. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, "Where, where, where's that song that I heard? <laughs> Must be on some like B side or something." Oh, no. <laughs> but uh yeah no i was wondering like did you guys intentionally or maybe i've just missed them did you make a, a, several music videos that that we haven't seen very often or did you stay away from that no we just didn't make a lot um mm-hmm. we did one for trunk full of amps uh we did one for um i did an ep a couple of years ago uh for a song called runaway yeah <clears throat> and um the guy who did that now works for uh colbert doing all oh, oh shorts. yeah but he killed it. Like he was just like, I got. He had all these concepts, and one was with cats, and uh, so he he wrangled that whole thing himself. He's genius. Wow. That, he's a Tennessee boy too, so that was really that cool. runaway video is awesome. Yeah, I love it. Uh, yeah. I love that song. Uh, I mean, you just mentioned two of the songs that I love self the most from is Runaway oh, and thanks. Trunkful Amps. I thanks, love that. Man. I love those songs. The that Trunkful. I heard that you you guys basically just kind of came up with that live, and then we did. At least, uh, yeah, because there's there's three songs we wrote in a day. So we wrote Trunkful of Amps, Ordinaire, and I Love to Love Your Love, My Love, <laughs> in one sitting. Yeah. Really? Because wow. we were making breakfast with girls during the week uh, at the Bennett House and at Ocean Way. And so our weekend thing was like, I want, I'd want i always wanted to do a toy instrument album. So we would just, just tw- you know, kind of tweak on that on the weekends. So we would just sit down with our little things and just dink around, and I would record the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And then just come through those recordings and find the good bits. <laughs> And I actually have that piece. I have a um on a hard drive. It's just oh, that's when we wrote Trunk Phone. Oh, there's Ordinary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah that is awesome. Uh, yeah. It's got that. It's got it, I mean, it sounds like something that you kind of came up with, but it it's turned into this like just awesome rocker of a song. <laughs> and I love all the little the little, you know, elements you throw in there, like E L O and you right, know yeah. Mama, you yeah. know, and and, 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 and uh yeah, just that, all those little things in there are the are thing. great. I love it. Yeah, that's the one that's the song most people know. It's like mm-hmm. oh you did tr- you did trunk full of amps. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well really? speaking of we we have to ask you about Gizmadri, because yeah. that 
It's it's unlike anything that I've ever heard. This is where oh, you nice. created an entire album <clears throat> using toy instruments. Mm -hmm. But the issue is, so if you go out and you and you buy it now, which you should, um, it won't sound like it's made on toy instruments, though. Right. It's amazing because I knew that going into it. But if you listen to something like the What a Fool Believes cover or something mm -hmm. like that, without knowing that, it would sound just like you're using regular instruments. Right, right. What, what the hell, man? Like, where did that come from? Why are you lying? Why, why are you the way that you are? No, um, the only toy um, band that I had heard was a band called Pianosaurus, and it was kind of that. It was kind of that violent, fimsy, uh -huh. collegiate, just like a toy piano, a toy bass, and toy drum kit. And it was just like kind of dinky, bing, 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 bing. But they had these like little collegey songs. It was a good band. Um, this record had come out um, released by the company Roland. Um, cause they just released this box called the groove box. And oh yeah. They made a CD called at home with the groove box. Yeah, yeah. And it was artists like Buffalo daughter Beck. like basically they gave them the, the beat box. Like every sound has to emanate from this thing, except the vocals. You can do the vocals however you want. And I remember thinking like, that's pretty cool. And Roger Manning had just done the Moog cookbook where he was covering mm -hmm. like Nirvana songs with really funny sounding mugs. So all these little things were happening, and I was like, I've always wanted to – I mean, I used to love have my little star guitar and all that stuff. So I was like, I want to – there's all this stuff that no one's using. And I was very anti-Nashville at the time too because mm -hmm. you just drove around and there was no liaisons for rock and roll or urban music. And I was really frustrated being here, and I was just like, I'm not in the right place, and um, I don't want it to sound – I don't want to use a traditional chord progression. I don't want to write the, what they want me to write. I just want to write crazy shit. And um, so – the thing came to life and so we just started stockpiling you know nieces and nephew toys of like they don't use any of this shit anymore and they just pile it in our car these are mostly from family members and things like that yeah, yeah really yeah yeah awesome. we'd ebay some stuff if we couldn't find certain things but we were ripping the voice boxes out of things <laughs> and and we just databased everything so the the rule was is that everything had to emanate from a toy and um so we would lay it out so you could take a little tiny ding on a little piano and mic it up and then lay that out on a keyboard and add low into it and make a bass out of it. Oh, oh my wow. God. So it's like, the little toy can't do that, but it is from. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You've converted it to, yeah. yeah well, it's and still legit. You if, know? You, if you did play it with toy instruments and you had every single solitary note had to be out of a out of a toy instrument mm -hmm. it would gotta, sound silly it would be a jimmy fallon sketch <laughs> yeah it would be right yeah i mean you sample a key of a show and hut piano which is you know the, the toy piano and then you pitch that down over an 88 key sampler down here it sounds awesome and gnarly yeah. so that, that's what i would use so i would use that bit of what was normally dinky so that's why it ended up sounding like that doesn't sound like toys but it's just been seasoned and brewed and it's like in hunt for Red october when they record the caterpillar drive of the russian mm -hmm. sub mm -hmm. and then he speeds it up so that he can hear it uh, going dun, 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 mm -hmm. he's like that's gotta be mechanical yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a bad car <laughs> yeah i watched a video I, I i've just been recently just to kind of unplug at night watching like outraged people compilations on oh those are fun. <laughs> there's this one this is what made me think of this is this guy is like the, the tree's in a giant old Ford truck and he's got the hood up and the guy is standing right here that's being filmed like over by this guy's leg and it's like <laughs> so the guy they can't see each other so he's starting the thing and this guy's got a wrench he's just going gong, 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 <laughs> on the front bumper like every time he tries to start it <laughs> it's like that is <laughs> ruthless <laughs> you gotta start watching these oh things oh my god before I go to bed <laughs> it's amazing yeah I don't know it's what it's what I use to kind of just decompress <laughs> But one last thing about Gizmodri, you I found um, the the tiny drums that like when you record them and you compress them, that they actually sound louder and bigger than a giant drum. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh my god! Yeah, because they're just so bink, they're so tight. Huh? That like that's why the drums sounded really good. We were like, wow, these actually record really well. They really do. Yeah. They sound they sound at times like huge, like you're saying. Yeah. Because you must have gone through like a million permutations to get to you know, the register that you really wanted for each of, you know, each each individual drum, snare, and bass, and all that stuff, too. It was it was nuts, man. I would never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but it's worth it, you know, we're all young, we're, you yeah. know, you do stuff like that. Yeah, man, it was nuts. It's interesting, uh, Dead Man is on this, this album, and that is, if somebody asks me to encapsulate, like, 
self in uh-huh. a song. That's what I point them to. Oh, interesting. Because it's so it's it's very poppy. It's very, very straightforward. It's very quirky yeah. lyrically and and musically. And it's just like you know this is this is self in a nutshell right here. Awesome. Even though which is which is insane because you've got such a crazy range of, yeah. of things. But yeah. It's uh, I think it's my happy place. I think it's that's why it's best to just confine me to being underneath other things, just <laughs> because it's like it's so hard to like throw in everything with it. Because I I just can't distill down of like I'm a I'm a jazz singer. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy you know? because you mix all those elements in there. Like you said, like you, you'll throw in a bridge, you know, Depeche mm-hmm. Mode or like a jazz bridge or something like yeah. that. Back in Subliminal Plastic Mode, it's like. You know, I'm telling you stuff that you already know, but um, but <laughs> th- that, that was time? just that, remember that time that you did that. But that's what always like really impressed me about your songwriting and the execution of it is that it doesn't go in a linear path necessarily, right. and that's that's kind of what I dig about the uh, the score for the the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles show is that it'll go in different directions. I heard I was watching the uh, uh, the one with the uh, almost Coco type of villain, the, uh, the bones oh, yeah. versus the flesh guy. Bone man. And, yeah. uh, he had a great theme. And then, you know, you'd hear like harpsichord in there for mm-hmm. a little bit. And then it would go to like this flamenco type of thing. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so, so that's, that's very cool. And it's, it's really made me pay attention more to, to score when it comes to, you know, animated work in particular, because you do just get caught up, especially yeah. as crazy as those visuals are. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of guys that I really respect, um, that do score for cartoons. Um, it is a ton of work. I mean, I go to my daughter's school and they have like these mixers and the parents are like, so what do you do? And I'm like, well, I score music for cartoons. I didn't even realize that they had music in them. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do. And it's a lot. And, uh, if you, if you watch it without it, it's not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine. it's, it's, it's everything. It really, really is important. And I, I just, I'm so thankful that it's still an organic process of like, we need someone to do this. It has to be written for this as opposed to librarying it out, which happens a lot of times too. Really? Yeah, definitely. How does that even work? Just like, you know, compressed can 22 minutes or 12 minutes of, of score. Just for certain shows. If it's not, if it doesn't need dramatic kind of underscore to, emote mm-hmm. like um a show that i did sanjay and craig um like you know burping fart jokes mm-hmm. you know uh we need punk rock for when they're in the arcade and we'd like you know something in this vein so i would do that and be like yeah it's kind of yeah i need maybe a little more in this vein okay do that but they have like these libraries of like you know jingle punks these types of companies oh, I see. that um they just there's tw- here like oh, twenty punk rock things we can oh that one works you throw oh, it in. Okay. just well, like yeah, I got you like iMovie type just I'm, I'm glad that they don't but why don't they I wonder why don't they do that all the time yeah um I guess it's just a quality um people yeah look look that's what I choice that's what right? I'm thankful for is that people yeah, yeah. actually care about artisanal. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's the thing, right? That's or, a, organic. The music. choice is made between art or cost yeah, there. Yeah. And, yeah. and if they choose the library stuff, they doesn't necessarily mean they don't value art. But in this case, they seem to value art more. It just depends on if someone cares about what music is in the show. Because you'll hear, uh, we watch a lot of cartoons in my house, obviously. And I, my, my children are young, so we watch a lot of those. And I'll hear the same cue in two different shows. And yeah. it's just kind of like, all right. Oh, you mm. can pick that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Are they impressed, by the way, with with Ben? Um, they don't really. I mean, they they're like uh, ah, the Ninja Turtles. Uh, I saw them the other day. <laughs> <laughs> when Anna was younger, it was kind of cool. Um, when I was doing Henry Hugel Monster, um, I would record the cast for the songs, and they were in L.A., so I would do it via just audio Skype. Mm. So whenever we were recording, Anna would she was like five, six. She would come into the studio. And I'd be like, hey, Anna's in here. And so Laura Jill Miller, who was on uh, that Nell Carter show when she was a kid. She was a kid actor. Oh, uh, on different, not different. Facts shows. of Life? She's on, nah. What was Nell Carter? Um, it was. She's the, she was the voice for Henry. She does tons of cartoon voices, and she's really good. But she would always be a champ. Give me a break. Give yeah. me a break. Yes. Give ah. me a break. <laughs> so uh, 
Yeah, so Anna would come in and they would stay in character. Oh yeah, oh. and so Anna would like get Rosie. How's the weather in Mooresville today? <laughs> oh, it's great, Anna. Oh, you know, and it was like this is the greatest moment of my life. Oh, my awesome. kids like thinks that you know she thinks she's talking to Henry Hogan. <laughs> that's awesome. What are you gonna do next? You're gonna keep um, this up, obviously. They are. They're doing a film for Netflix. Picked up a film for Rise. So I'm really just pleading with them. Please let me do the film it'd be my first feature oh, wow so i had read about that in wikipedia and i was about to say you know wikipedia is our paper of record so that's right <laughs> i need to ask you <laughs> about uh the movie that they've announced and everything i guess it's so early i mean yeah you're 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 still just hoping to be a part of it at this point but but it's legit stuff like they were they were um they're they're working on it's very early so they're just picking out directors and it's legit people so i don't know if i'll get a job mm -hmm. but, um, i'm really pushing for it like please let mm -hmm. me just do it yeah on, on that scale awesome wow so would it essentially extrapolate the the work that you do over what a you know a 90 we're minute hoping, thing yeah. or something like that we're hoping i mean i've just crazy. i've literally just um just been just like emailing everyone that I can <laughs> ad nauseum without trying to really just uh, make them delete my my friendship. <laughs> it would be ridiculously awesome to see your name as often as we see Danny Elfman and Mark Mothersbaugh sure, yeah, and other yeah, people absolutely. that have well, apps, I know? look at it like I, I had a quirky band. Danny Elfman had a quirky band. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Mothersbaugh had a quirky band. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hans Zimmer had a quirky band. Right, but, yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> we're, we're the good ones. We're supposed to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're supposed to do this. <laughs> yeah. Wow. The, the parallels are just right there in front I of know. you. Or, I know. <laughs> as opposed to like a music school, you know, Juilliard. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. You can't go to that court. <laughs> One of these That's days illegal. you're going to get into the uh, into the Oscars. Yeah, I'd be I palling around with uh, John Williams. Yeah, I, mm. I um, I had a meeting with Ivan Reitman for that movie Evolution. Oh you guys yeah, ever seen I that? oh wow! Don't you have a? Isn't there a self song on the soundtrack? Yeah, thing? I wrote the end title to that one. Oh wow! It's called Out with a Bang, and um, so I would meet with Ivan Reitman, and he was like, you know, one, I did what he wanted, whatever. We were at uh, Warner Brothers Studios, like classic, and um, the guy that I was with. Uh, that was kind of my wrangler was like, Hey, one of my clients is working in the, in the B over here. You want to go drop in for a second? And I was like, yeah. And I go in there and it's John Williams scoring a full orchestra. Yo-Yo Ma first chair. Oh, wow. And I was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> like I'm just literally glued to the back wall. Oh, just casual God. John Williams <laughs> stumbling upon. And they do this whole take and then they come in and Yo-Yo Ma and John Williams just sit down and they're listening to playback and they're not even speaking to each other. They're just like listening to stuff and going, <laughs> <laughs> like this telepathy yeah, this psychic connection <laughs> I feel like Christopher guessed it was a type of telepathy <laughs> that the dog has right. <laughs> Arlen Pepper <laughs> you don't oh stop naming nuts I can name, I can name 40 nuts <laughs> peanuts pine nuts <laughs> it's also the name of a town <laughs> by the way selenium is the way to beat the aliens in evolution. Oh, oh really? Good. I'm glad to know that. I am head and shoulders. Head. They Go use on. head and shoulders. Oh, awesome. oh that's right. Contains selenium. Is Duchovny in that? Yes, yep. he is. Yeah, I remember that movie being awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was uh, Orlando, Orlando uh, Jones. Orlando Jones. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, it was a fun romp. It was. Did Reitman direct that? I think he, he did. did. I think he did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was in, uh, like 2000, 2000. Yeah, somewhere, somewhere around there. Yeah. Yeah. So you lived in L.A. for a while? Ten years. Really? Wow. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what'd you think? I loved it. I mean, it's 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 crazy, mm -hmm. but I liked the pace of it, you know? I liked Ooh. the pressure of working there. Um, I had worked with a mastering engineer, Bob Ludwig, who's mastered everything, like every every record ever. and um, Audio master, not Audio master, master yeah. <laughs> he has mastered everything. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I have the power. No. Uh, he, um, yeah, he's just amazing, and and he's up in Portland, Maine, oh, wow. Cobblestone Street, Fisherman yeah. Town. I was like, "What are you doing here?" And he's like, "I, Matt, I did ten years in New York City, and now I live where I want to live." And I, I was twenty one when I worked with him, and um, so that always stuck with me. And I, I just couldn't do ten years in New York. I just was like, went to L.A. being a Tennessee boy. I was like, "It's got grass, yeah. you know, <laughs> sunshine." So. Yeah. Uh, I did 10 years and I made a name for myself. And um, once my kids were born, I was like, I just don't want to really raise them. 
out there. Yeah. Because their family's here. I want them to know their family. So we moved back here. And um, yeah, it's 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 kind of awesome. You can kind of work wherever you want to these mm-hmm. days. Yeah. I realized that I wasn't attending sessions that were just right down the street from me. I you was were Skyping doing in. Skyping, yeah. So it was like, that's a light bulb, right? That's so expensive. Yep. Yep. Well, and plus Nashville has blown up so much i mean it's not la but it's god it's it might as well be there's a lot what it more was. talent here now or at least grab being pulled here mm, yeah um, yeah we do have a great reputation for talent and i remember moving there and thinking like whoa not everybody's a stellar musician like <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> you know yeah because yeah. you get really used to just a little 12 year old just blazing a fiddle or yep. somebody just mm. on a guitar that i got out there and people were just kind of like Gong, gong. <laughs> I mean, you had, it's world class talent, but I just was kind of that's definitely cult, culture shock musically. Yeah, but I appreciate Nashville now. I didn't appreciate it when I was making self records living here. I was very frustrated, and um, I appreciate it now. It's it, there's a whole layer of things going on, and it's up from like eighty a day to a hundred people a day. You oh, know? there you go. So. I think we all had that phase uh, for yeah. native Nashvilleians, mm-hmm. um, especially in that era, because it was so. Like you said, it, it it seemed restrictive back in the in that time period. And, and most people you meet, like uh, most people I meet, they're like, "I've been here a month." Yeah. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're uh, they're they're probably got uh, seniority on a lot of ninety uh, percent of people. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't. There wasn't very there weren't very many places to hang out like uh, after hours, late night, mm-hmm. anything. Spe- people go, growing up in, in our era or whatever didn't have much to do in Nashville at that point in the mid late nineties. Mm-hmm. it wasn't it didn't you know <laughs> it was rocket town and rocket town closed at 10 <laughs> yeah yeah everything had, closed had, early yeah they had like skate in pizza <laughs> yeah <laughs> no no beer <laughs> it wasn't until like gosh it was only really recently like six seven years ago where it all started where it all started yeah. blowing up. i mean broadway's out of control like all the country stars um cmt and the show nashville just kind of like creating that whole thing i remember second avenue broadway that was just this old giant man that would sit down there and busk Mm -hmm. and i I would always give him money and one night it was really cold and i threw a i had a boatload of change i went flump right into his coffee oh Oh, 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 man and he was like man (laughs) (laughs) i'm so sorry and now you go down there and it's just like taylor swift you know, singer songwriter type girls and people, it's just packed. Mm-hmm. And all these country stars are buying up all the honky tonks and building up these honky tonks. Mm-hmm. And Kid Rock's big ass, dumb <laughs> meatball gravy pipe dance hall, whatever. It's like, what the hell is going on here? Yeah. So yeah, you have the, you have, you have the, it goes both ways, I guess. Yeah. You know? It definitely it, does. It's like, yeah, a lot more to do, but also there's a lot of crap. Too. You're talking about Velvet Thunder down in uh, on uh, Second Avenue, right? The the old guy that played the blues is, back is that in the what, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he wouldn't yeah. talk to you unless you nope. you gave him money. No, mm-hmm. I, he'd just he just be was, hanging he out. He was the only guy, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was, and uh, he made some money. I mean, he just mm, sure. you know he played he played he had like four songs, and one of them uh, was about a big leg lady with a big old butt. Mm-hmm. Yep, and I everybody that loved one. that one. And you know, as soon as he get a crowd around him, he'd hit yeah. him with that that tagline. Oh, yeah. It I would kill. <laughs> He's showering. They're making it rain on him. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> daily hit. <laughs> I was about to say, if if he wanted to stay and and talk more movies, Ooh. we we would glad yeah, be good. glad to have you. Uh, yeah, if good. if not, um, and you have to go off and uh, and uh, do some important stuff, then well, we I, can I do wanna, that. I want to hear you guys talk movies. Okay, okay. great. Bring it. We can do oh, that. He's a brave soul. Over here. <laughs> All right, so we're we're going to uh, we got a segment where we basically recommend things and warn things. It's very straightforward. Um, but uh, we've got a backlog because. Further backstory, we've been doing this movie road trip where we've been going across the U.S. in every state and going through a list of the movies set in that state wow. uh, to kind of compare, you know, what, what is the, the overall kind of perspective of, of each state geographically in the U.S. Are you visiting a film site? Are you, like, where it was filmed? Just where or it's just, set. Where it's, just where it's set. Just where it's set. Okay. Yeah, so there'll be stuff like in Montana or, like, South Dakota where there's nothing and then there. We were currently in Washington, D.C., where there's a fuck ton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So we haven't been able to, to get to our recommendations, so we've got a backlog. We're backed yeah, up. Yeah. We're back up. We got, we got, we got we some got, blue, we got unleash. blue balls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> unleash. Chris, uh, you want to unleash? Yeah, sure, why not? Unleash. Um, 
I I don't know what to I don't know what to call this either a recommendation uh, or a rec a warn or a warn I think it's all three uh-huh. um, so I guess it's a rec a warn um, Gaspar Noe's climax oh no oh did you see this at the Bell Court I did oh I saw no this at the Bell Court I've I, heard so many mixed things about this movie. right yeah and see, that's how you'll feel <laughs> watching it um. <laughs> I watched it in Belcourt uh, renovated and they have a small auditorium at the top. And this is where this was. So it was like oh, shit. me and like 15 other people and uh, yeah. just kind of like hanging out in this. Okay. I'm going, <laughs> I want to recommend this so much because there's so much like to it, but I mean, in a rec- <laughs> okay. So you have this dance, dance troupe and sophia patel is in this movie oh wow and uh and uh it starts off like they're just getting to know each other actually the very beginning of it is uh audition tapes and they're sitting there saying i want to be a part of this because so on and so forth and it's it's very almost like us how it begins because it's very 80s uh it's an 80s kind of videotape looking Hmm. thing this i think it's set in the 90s though um and uh everybody's giving their sort of characters and everything uh and then the next thing is they're there it's like the first day and they've just had a rehearsal and they start partying a little bit and and gaspar noe does all this stuff where the camera's just like you know uncut shots for like minutes and minutes yeah, yeah. and minutes goes around the entire room everybody's talking about what they want to do and everything as it you don't know what happens though like as far as time is concerned because something has happened where the, the punch has been spiked and uh, everybody starts acting really, really insane with drugs or with yeah, it was something something was in the punch, mm-hmm. and then uh, people start realizing, oh, I'm fucked up. <laughs> uh, uh, and who could have done this to us? <laughs> and uh, anybody who's not fucked up is a suspect. All right. And so, like, the so it's fir- like the anniversary party in Clue, all just kind of, <laughs> <laughs> kind of is, <laughs> <laughs> kind it's of beautiful. is. Um, and, uh, so like one of the first people, they're like, oh, you're, you're not messed up. Well, we're going to, we're going to kick you out. And they kick this dude out into the cold and lock the door. It's snowing. It's like got to be like 10 degrees outside or something like that. And, uh, and, uh, people are just, there's like a, just a bunch of people dancing and there's people getting into arguments and there's people talking about like, this is what I'm going to do to this girl. And this is what I'm going to do to that girl. Hmm. And, and, uh, everybody's apparently been having sex with each other. Everybody, um, <laughs> And uh, and the 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 movie just spirals and spirals and spirals down to where it's just every anything goes at this point. Just a lot of craziness going on, and uh, it's it wraps you up. It wraps you up, but you don't know if you you should be wrapped up in it because it's so like it. There's no story. It's just these people got messed up one night. There's what you know. Here's the aftermath of that. Wow. And uh and it's just a just a lot of just craziness going on. There's people who die in this, there's people who make very bad decisions, there's people who <laughs> This uh, is a party that they're at? They're at a party. Yeah, it's a party inside a sort of a their studio. Okay. Um so I, all this all this debauchery is going on and no one thinks like maybe we should go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a reference in the, during the, uh, audition tapes and everything, just like us, where there's a, either a tape of Suspiria on the right side oh, really? or, uh, maybe a, a writing, uh, on Suspiria. And there's a lot of Suspiria parallels in well, this too. It, that kind of reminded me of it. Um, just kind of the look and the aesthetic, mm-hmm. uh, especially of the new Suspiria. Yeah. Um, yeah. You could not have got me wanting to see this movie more. It sounds almost like a mother type of plot. Yeah, right? yeah, kind of. I mean, it, it, there is no plot. Mm. Let me let me stress: there mm. is nothing. It's it's, <laughs> it's it is people getting fucked it's up. people people drinking spiked punch and doing a lot of crazy shit. <laughs> and uh, I'm down. And, and it and it and and amazingly, it's not nearly as excessive as you think it would be. Mm. Considering, like, you would think, though, there's just nothing but re- like gobs of nudity and like you know blood everywhere but it's not really like that uh, there is a cut there's actually a- considering gaspar in a way you, you would think that right yeah yeah for sure when I mean, you see irreversible and you see um uh enter the void yeah those movies are just uh, just you know there are i mean he's got that certain style where it's just craziness 
Um, is this his most accessible movie? It might be. It might be. I can't. I can't wrap my head around this. Guy. I watched uh, the other one that he did. That's on Netflix. The uh, one that's called Love. Yeah. I saw that one, yeah. and that one the, the the draw the draw to that is that they're actually having sex, and it was in three D, and it was in three D. Apparently, you had somebody ejaculate at you in three D. <laughs> yeah, yeah, first time, Seriously, right, right at you. Yeah. Why would I want to watch right it? Maybe you. your first time. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, well, now you can watch it without the three D, so you don't have to worry about that. But uh, the <laughs> but yeah that that movie that movie isn't. I mean, that's the the that's the most different movie I've ever seen of his. Um, yeah that's another one it's, it, it's, it's kind of just it's a regular movie yeah. except for you know there's that stunt basically of oh they're actually having sex okay mm-hmm. um but the other three movies that i mentioned god those things are don't watch those back to back no uh but uh climax i would say i'm gonna say recommend mm. mainly because it's just it's one of those type of movies you gotta experience that at some point i'm down i know it's not a jeremy movie well, it doesn't sound very much like it's a not a movie. it's not a jeremy movie but it's it's something that kind of if you if you're open to just getting into some like just nonsense you know some crazy nonsense then yeah just uh yeah let it take you i love nonsense yeah man what's a jeremy movie what are you what are you into oh uh well what he means in that regard what do you mean in that regard <laughs> uh, Ooh. Uh, i am saying schlocky that, horror with lots of nudity yeah well <laughs> right, I, no. I mean and there's not lots uh, i'm a big fan of all five wrong turn movies if that tells you anything, okay even though they're all terrible <laughs> yeah so so yeah he, he he'll in the horror genre it has to be the terrible kind it ha- okay. can't be the um you know the the slick uh High conjuring bridge. types yeah, yeah. or yeah. whatever mm. uh but movies that go a little bit off the wall and, and off that's center jeremy that's movie. that yeah how much do we want to fight today a lot well, sure do you really let's, want to let's, bring it let's fight you're gonna say something that you like i've got th- i've got two that are gonna upset barrett and i'm trying to decide which one i really want to say <laughs> i've okay hmm. i let's talk about there will be blood <laughs> <laughs> Wow, he just <laughs> side cocked his chair. That looks. Dangerous. This movie has recently begun running on stars. Really, Showtime. Okay. I've n- I've never seen it all the way through uh, until this past week. Mm-hmm. I have always bluffed my way through conversations about this movie because so did I expect to find it an A plus plus that I just talked about it as though it was every time it's ever come up. I we like all have movies much. like that. You didn't like it very much. No, I think I like the the phantom thread more that guy's certainly more likable and you know what i think about the guy in phantom thread and his likability okay 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 i I find i'm frustrated with both scenes of confession when he's confessing in the church about betraying his son or whatever Mm -hmm. and then later when the pastor is confessing about it all being lies both of those scenes just ring false as shit to me why because neither one of them is telling the truth uh, yeah, well, they're, yeah, they're 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 okay. They are both lying to get what they want. Yes, and they're both they're both assholes. That's what that movie. Uh, says. Yes. Mm. Okay, I you're, asked you're how right. Bad you wanted to. You're fight. right, and you're right. <laughs> but I think we we may have actually mentioned this before. Mm-hmm. There's a point in this. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? Minute, there will be right? blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a minute, and uh. I. But I honestly, I kind of fake my way through conversation. There you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. It happens it's long. all the time. It's very, very long. It's very long, yep. and it's very intense. It's yeah. a very intense performance. Yeah. But in that scene, in that first confession, where I've, I've abandoned my child and all that stuff, he breaks. I don't think he does. Se- he does. I think he does. I, I abandoned my boy. Yeah. My abandoned my. I think boy. you can interpret yeah. it either way. Yes. I don't think the character actions up to and after that point suggest there was any realness in what he said. Oh, God, I could have this fucking conversation all the uh, no, well, Let me be clear. The, there is artistry at work here. Mm-hmm. There are long, dialogue-free stretches of great camera work and action, like the fire. Like it's, There is artistry here. I'm yeah. not saying this is a piece of shit at who, all. Who directed that film? Paul, Paul, Thomas, Thomas, Anderson. Thomas Anderson, who is... 
black and white for me and like hit or miss like i either yeah. really like it or i'm like or it's inherent vice and i don't um <laughs> fuck you <laughs> <laughs> well I, this is the thing i think what we're realizing is that you like this guy more than because you love the master i love and the master. i can't get i have not finished that start to finish i've tried twice to watch it and both times have tuned out it's the same thing with there will be blood basically no i watched that all the way through no i know just recently though right yes just recently so it's been the same with those so two before it, now. i'm i'm not i'm not gathering though that that's the only reason why you didn't like the movie was just those two things no i, I, I ultimate it's probably a recommend I, the only reason it's a record warn is that i was i was less whelmed than i expected to be when i watched it i expected it to be better than any pt anderson movie i'd ever seen this is your fault no i'm just kidding um <laughs> and i just I, it felt I, I had a hard time connecting to any character in that story. Interestingly, and not just because uh, it was in the 1800s. Interestingly enough, I thought you were down on There Will Be Blood as well. Uh, I think the last time that we talked about it, I've, I've found some, but I've also seen it probably like eight to ten yeah, times. Yeah, I've always wow. been high on it, but, yeah. uh, but I thought that you were also low on this movie. No, I'm not low on it at all. Uh, I, I poked some holes in it because there are some... Yeah, there are some kind of character decisions that I think are out of character in that, and there are some there are some shots that are overlong. I think, um, but I think overall, you just can't. It's like with Phantom Thread. I think his performance carries that movie, even if you don't like the content of that movie. It carries it. The over. reason why I love those two scenes that he's talking about is that they're both shysters. They're both shysters the entire movie. Yes. and his his point at the end is to show how much of a shyster he is, and he wants him to admit it. Uh -huh. And I have always found that very powerful that he finally got this guy. Look, he's been putting on this face. I'm building this church for our town, our new Boston and everything. And, and like, uh, I'm, I'm the guy who's got all the answers that God wants to give and everything. And then finally, in a moment of weakness, he tells him, I want you to say this out loud. And he does because he doesn't believe it. Well, and he wants the five grand, right? Yeah, he wants money. I mean, you can make an argument that Paul Dano's character is as loathsome, if not more, than Daniel That's, Day Lewis's. Okay, this is my problem. And it's the same thing that I said about Phantom Thread, which I went on to watch two more times. <laughs> it's that it's, I find it hard to find anybody to root for. Mm. Okay. <sighs> now, yeah, I mean, it's a classic anti hero. You're, you're right. There is nobody to yeah, root for. It's right? the devil versus the devil. Yeah. yeah. Him, yeah him, pick your devil and root. I had a hard time. Sure. Him him winning doesn't give you any, like, give you, it's like, you don't want him to win. You don't want this kind of guy to be in power. Yeah, yeah. Especially, and you don't want Paul Dano to win either because you know what he is. No, and, mm. and the funny thing is at the end of that movie is that it's almost like the movie, it's a, it's a sort of epilogue, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's zooming into his empty mansion and everything, and H.W. comes up, and it's like, Okay, he's got a chance to reconcile with this kid. Maybe this character is going to be redeemed. And he says the most awful shit yeah. mm -hmm. ever to this kid. Yeah. And it's like, although, in a way, that's probably the nicest thing he does the whole movie is to at least free that kid. Yeah. Yeah. Because that yeah, kid true. is going to be Aaron Paul at the end of Breaking Bad <laughs> after this. He is free of that baggage. <laughs> right. I mean, it was yeah. awful what he says. Anyway, you know, I'm not down on the movie. I just I watched it thinking I'm finally going to watch this fucking masterpiece. Yes. <laughs> and it was just, you know, I, I was gripped. I watched it all the way to the end. But I there's going to I feel like there are certain scenes. If you end up watching this again, that you're going to get wrapped up in maybe and and, and eventually you'll be like you know what I like it a little bit better this time you may never be completely sold on it. i do like a lot of the oil science discovery shit mm -hmm. that kind of is non-explained mm -hmm. like dialogue free yeah. you see some mm -hmm. sketches you see early rigs you see some attempts um and that stuff's fascinating to me anyway it's the I death just, you know, the death of the ri when the guy dies in the oh yeah yeah, yeah that freaked me out i just remember lots of tension and very like um for lack of a better reference like just very cinematic Lawrence of Arabia slow shots. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, so it's like, I don't know if that helps us. I need to watch it again because I'm clearly out of my element. And but. by the way, Johnny Greenwood, uh, the, scored uh, it. yeah, scored it. He so. had a quirky little band. Yeah, he had a quirky, <laughs> quirky little band. That guy's super talented. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you no know, kidding. Mm -hmm. What is yours, Barrett? <clears throat> you know, I was going to, uh, Recommend something that we had talked about before, and I'll come back to it. But I do want to talk. I actually mentioned this in a couple of emails to Matt. Mm -hmm. The Dirt. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah. On Netflix. 
is a problematic movie. Is this the like, Motley Crue thing? This is the Motley Crue thing. All right. Uh, it's problematic, and it's super watchable, and... I don't know if I ever want to watch it again, mm -hmm. but I'm kind of glad that I watched it. Yeah. yeah. There's no surprises here. No. I, I think you, you may have mentioned this in, in one of our conversations. Mm -hmm. Like, we know they were debauched. We yeah. knew that there was a lot of drug use. We knew that Nikki Six died. We knew, you know, all this fucking craziness going on mm -hmm. in the drugs. But the, the high point of this movie, for sure, is towards the beginning of it. Uh, have you seen this yet, man? I haven't. Uh, it's 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 crazy because it's I watched got a the trailer cast of, and I was like, Pete Davidson's in it, and okay, uh, I want to talk know. about Pete Davidson <laughs> specifically, <laughs> really, in this movie, and you know, just he's in it for like two scenes on the Earth. Uh, <laughs> the Earth. <laughs> no, no, he's in it. He's in it for a few scenes. Uh, no, but the cast is a bunch of essentially no names. All right, the, the most famous person besides Pete Davidson is Machine Gun Kelly. I guess for Game of Thrones fans, who is it? King Raymond, Joff... Oh, uh, Joffrey? Joff no, Cock. It's not Joff him. Um, let me look it up, because I don't remember... Ramsey Bolton, yes. Ramsey, Ramsey Bolton. So, uh, yeah, I'm not super familiar it's like, with that. It's got, he's got some, like, Irish name that's probably, like... It, it's, it looks like you and Rion, but it's probably, like... <laughs> <you know? laughs> it's probably, like, Pete Davidson. <laughs> yeah, Pete Davidson. <laughs> it's yeah. pronounced Pete. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the most famous guy really is Machine Gun Kelly. All right, Machine Gun Kelly, right? Terrible rapper. Are you familiar with Machine Gun yeah. Kelly? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't like his raps. Mm -hmm. I don't like his, his thing. Mm -hmm. Uh... He's the best thing about this movie. Yeah, wow. he kind he, of is. He plays Tommy Lee, and I don't know Tommy Lee. I don't know if you've met Tommy Lee. We when we did Wired All Wrong, we had a MySpace page at the uh -huh. time, and um, the record came out, and the fir one of the first people that was on our face was Tommy Lee, and he was like, "Dudes, <laughs> That's awesome. dude, this shit's banging, man. Let's get together and." Do some jams, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't. I don't even think we wrote him back. Oh man, <laughs> he's a fine, fine person. Yeah, yeah. But, like we were just like, nah, we don't really want to do any. Oh my god. Well, when the, this movie starts, it's from Nikki Six's perspective. So he he grows up, you know, abusive childhood and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's this sob story, and then all of a sudden, the voiceover, the perspective changes. To Machine Gun Kelly as Tommy Lee, and he's all, he's exactly what that post was. He's right. all about the love and dudes and no, stuff very, like that. Very, that's very much, he yeah. seems like, I don't know him, but like, <laughs> yeah. he seems like a super sweet dude. You but know? it's, it's crazy that this character actually is the best part of this movie, maybe the whole way through, but certainly at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I'm a sucker for these orig band origin stories and mm -hmm. stuff like that, where like, you know, this is how Mick Mars, Mick, the Mick Mars character is actually really good in this too. I forget who plays him, but. Anthony Cavallero, uh, he plays he plays Mick Mars as like this. I didn't even realize he was so much older than the rest of the band. Yeah. But he's this grumpus, like fucking trolley, like it's uh, the Wolf Woman from Glow. You know what I mean? You, you I haven't seen, seen Glow. Glow? Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 I knew you were talking about. Kind of like, kind of like her. Okay. And then after it hits the the point where they get the deal through Pete Davidson, um, then it it just goes down this like cliche thing. The worst part of this movie, and I don't mean to be crass, is the fucking child death. All right, so oh, Vince Neil's, Vince son Neil's dies, yeah. uh, daughter dies, daughter, yeah. um, and they spend an excruciating amount of time on this. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it was difficult for him, and I sympathize with him. If he, he's definitely listening right now. Yes, he is. <laughs> so, Vince, listen, buddy. I'm sorry, but in a movie like this, we didn't need like 10 minutes of <laughs> this girl dying. No, no. Oh, wow. No. That's, what the, that's the problem with biopics for me in general, though, is that they always have one to five beats that feel thrown in just because everyone knows that happened. Yeah. And most yeah. biopics suffer from that some, well, somewhere along the way. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the last thing I'll say about this, Pete Davidson, I don't get Pete Davidson. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, I know he's got a thing. I know he's got a following. I know he's got fans. There's some things on SNL that are funny, I think. Uh, but he's, yeah, he's very, very Jimmy Fallon in the fact that like he generally doesn't make it through a sketch without like breaking character. Yeah. Exactly. And um, he's he's got some moments, but um, I think he's a likable person. He had a mental breakdown. Yeah, yeah. On social media, with all these things. Like he's a nice guy, and, and I like John Mulaney. So if mm. anybody, if John Mulaney's like this guy's legit, then I trust John Mulaney. You know. My issue with Pete Davidson is that it's always him. 
Like, whatever character that he's playing, it's always him. Right. And similar with Jimmy Fallon, even in Almost Famous, right? Like, you mm-hmm. know that's Jimmy Fallon. Didn't yeah. he of play course. the Night King in a Game of Thrones sketch this past weekend and yes. smile like Pete Davidson yeah. the whole way through? <laughs> yes, he did. And it's exactly Pete Davidson. Like, yeah. It's the first time I've ever he seen... He had one line and he was so made up. <laughs> yeah. It's the first time I've ever seen somebody in that much makeup and I knew exactly who it was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's that's worth... That's gotta be worth something. It is, it is. But yes, he does seem like a good guy and a very honest guy and all that he stuff. He may have the funniest part of this movie though and that's when uh they they do an almost uh adam mckay like type of thing in this where they go and interview the per- the character yeah. about something and, and uh there's a scene where i guess it's uh vince neal is banging this chick and uh it's nikki six actually is it nikki six yeah, yeah, yeah and uh and uh then vince neal is banging nikki six <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes it's an episode of mr show yeah. <laughs> and uh the the they someone walks in and they're like oh really and uh, it turns out it's this it's Pete Davidson's the whoever Pete Davidson's playing it's <laughs> it's uh it's his character's girlfriend. Yeah. And uh and uh and then they said oh he didn't find ever find out or something I don't remember. And he's like actually I found out like 6 months later uh <laughs> and uh and I just found out I, it was it was then I found out and it's like it was a very hard time for me yeah, when it I really think, hurt. Yeah, it really hurt <laughs> and uh and uh and I just real and I realized then and there that you never take your girlfriend around Motley Crue because they will fuck her. Yes. <laughs> yes. What did you do you agree with my overall assessment of the dirt or do you uh yeah, I mean yeah I I didn't like it at all. It was just uh, it, it, to me, it's it. This is a story that doesn't really need to be told. Mm-hmm. There's nothing about it that. Yeah. There was lots of MTV footage, like someone did a rockumentary or whatever about it, and there was all kinds of interviews with the band and with Ozzy Osbourne about all the tours that they did, where they were snorting ants and injecting <laughs> vodka, like just yeah, like yeah. moronically doing yeah. drugs. Like, why don't we just drink it? Yeah, <laughs> what is wrong with us? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, that, I mean, having seen all that, I can probably safely say that I've seen the dirt without seeing it. So. You have, <laughs> yeah, you have. You have. It, it, to me, it felt like because all four of them wrote the book that this was based on, mm. that it was more a therapeutic thing for them more mm-hmm. than it was for. Uh, us to watch really i didn't really right. you know it just didn't feel like a, a a story that needs to be told i've seen so many of these rock star goes bad movies mm-hmm. I, yeah there's no point it's better than bohemian rhapsody still though Oof. i think it is Oof. because it even though it pulls its punches on some of the scenes that were actually in the book that he got into hot water for and has now recanted um it goes further, and I appreciate it. If you are going to suggest that Freddie Mercury was debauched as much as he was, you know, let us let us have a little mm-hmm. little little taste. Yeah, you know, but there, there. I mean, that's <laughs> the reason why. That's the reason why that movie was able to uh, sort of hit all the quadrants. Yep. Because if they did go too far, they wouldn't have got. I mean, there's people I know who love that movie who don't approve of freddie mercury right oh, right, yeah. right yeah you know so jesus Christ. I, I was i was a li- i was taken aback by how many people like that movie yeah because oh he's, he's got a good voice. well it's the same thing as like seventy thousand titans fans many of which are of the redneck persuasion mm-hmm. chanting we will rock you along with freddie mercury yeah. he's out there like yeah Yay! oh yeah oh yeah did you see bohemian rhapsody i did What'd i you think? um I thought it was great. I don't need to see it again. It's just yeah. one of those things that's a mm-hmm. one and done for me. Mm-hmm. But um, I, uh, a friend of mine was working on some of the music, and um, John Fields, he's a very, very talented Minneapolis guy. His uncle wrote Funky Town. Oh, nice. Know, like, so he's really, really cool. We've known each other for a long time. Anyway, um, the guy who did the um, the, the overdubs, you, they used some Freddie Mercury uh, from the multi tracks because those have been floating around for a long mm-hmm. time. Lots of people have those, so you can just solo up Freddie's vo- vocal and use it in your film or whatever. Like it's, I'm sure they use some of that. But the other, the guy that's actually doing the vocal is from Nashville. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, and he um just had he just would it was something he would do at parties. He would just be like, oh, dude, do your Freddie Mercury impersonation. And he would just kill it. And people would be like, what the fuck? <laughs> and um, so they found him on YouTube. Like, Wow. Yeah. Brian May <laughs> was just like, that's our guy. It's that's just awesome. Kind of, just like the journey, you know, finding a guy in the Philippines. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. Changing you his life. Like fair. Fair. So, um, yeah, I thought, I, I thought it was a good film. I thought, like, all that stuff's very dramatized. But I thought they focused on nice things. You know, I don't know. 
<laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> we, I, 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 I found it was music centric enough for me to dig it, and it was like, that was the shit that was so great, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, especially in the theater when you had well, you probably have a nice home setup. What I'm doing now is I have a ultra short throw uh, projector. Oh yeah, yeah. So shoebox. Mm-hmm. Put it about a foot and a half from the wall, and you get 120 inches probably. Nice. Wow. So that's just on the wall, a couple of speakers and a subwoofer, and that just just rock that. Oh, awesome. oh my god, yeah, that's fantastic. It's, it's cool. really good picture. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it might be 1080. Uh, it's just not a super, not a lot of lumens. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's not super bright because it's you know not a it's not like a ten thousand dollar projector. It's yeah. just super portable. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that that's seems a to big be a big, screen. That's a big trend now. So I'm all these like all my Instagram feeds and stuff are just like the new portable 140 inches tiny little stick wand. That you, can, <laughs> you know, has a speak a Bluetooth speaker. They can you can see know? it from space. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, no, I, I always wanted like a really good projector. They were just always so expensive, mm. and um, I just I wanted the best stuff. So I my my long story long. Um, I want to get my home theater going again, mm. and um, that's that's just my happy place. Nice. It's like surround sound is is insane. No one really got into it just because it's so. There's only one tiny little magic position, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but I loved surround music. I got into all that stuff, like Buena Vista Social Club and surround. I was like, oh, I loved yeah. it. Oh wow! <laughs> and um, I wanted to explore mixing and surround, but not like you're on stage. But just panning stuff all over the place and ping ponging it, but then knowing that you would invest all this time making a surround sound piece of music, and people would listen to it on this and be like, "Why is it just a ping pong ball <laughs> <laughs> sound for ten minutes?" You know? you know what I would like to watch with a nice surround system would be like an Altman flick, like mash. Yeah. Or something oh yeah. yeah. Hear all the conversations going on at once mm. from the different angles where they actually are. Oh, oh yeah, that would be rad. Did you ever hear uh, Zerika, the Flaming Lips uh, album that they put out with four, four different uh, CDs? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I made it through a couple minutes of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was it four was... players, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then in ten seconds, in fifteen seconds, you got to turn on Wizard of the Oz, and then a, <laughs> a monkey shows up, and you give it a dollar. <laughs> Yeah, that was wild. I never, uh, I never did the four CDs. I, 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 they I did never it in, even heard of this. They, uh, they did it in parking garages, right? Where it was four separate discs. This was before Soft Bulletin came out. I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and four separate discs, and you were supposed to play them some simultaneously, and some you come in like ten. It'll give you a cue like ten seconds later. You hit this one, but you had to have four different. Players. Vessels mm-hmm. <laughs> for this to come out, yeah. right? It was very like, okay, turn the key. Oh, three, two, <laughs> one. You know. yeah, anyway, that's... do we want to do another? Do you have anything that you want to recommend? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I've just been working, so I'm a little out. I just, I liked the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Oh, oh right? yeah. well, that's my jam. Um, I don't even think I've made. I've gone. I've started it six times, and I don't think I've made it all the way to the end. But I just, I love the first bit. I love the Tom Waits. Yeah. Yeah. Tom Waits was he's awesome. so he was so great in that mm-hmm. and um he's a sneaky underrated actor i think he is and i just think the coen brothers are just like i don't know how they do it like when you see an interview with them or you you read about them they just seem like such sad sacks of dudes you know they just <laughs> seem so depressed but their work is so it just brings me so much joy i mean oh brother where are thou is one of the greatest i, I love that film i love um mm-hmm. miller's crossing all the you know fargo all the all their stuff. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. just so good. They are. They did and Lebowski too, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. So I actually have some, I actually, um, that was filmed at Hollywood Lanes and um, for a Christmas present one year, a friend of mine got me a bowling ball and it had two bowling pins on top of it. And um, I was like, where'd you get these bowling pins? She's like, well, they demolished Hollywood Lanes. Oh yeah. And made a part, you know, built a, built something else. And I was like, so these are from Hollywood Lanes. And I was like, so these are probably like the last. These <laughs> are, awesome. you know, the That's last. Awesome. This is some Lebowski <laughs> legitimate yeah. bowling pins. So hop on eBay, see what I can get from yeah. that. That's right. That's right. That's awesome. It's got the, the best version of Hotel California I've ever heard on there. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's like the so Spanish good. version? Yeah. It's the, uh, what is that style of music? It's not Esperanto. It's a, it, that's the language. It's, it's uh, not really flamenco. <laughs> the either. William it's Shatner just, language. It's just, uh, Tahano? Tahano? Tahano. Yes. Tahano, yeah. Tahano music. Mm-hmm. It's th- that kind of style. 
Okay. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. Otherwise, I fucking hate the Eagles, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've been watching a lot of Tron Legacy lately because yeah, that baby. also recently came on Stars. Yeah. And I've he's never seen like twenty twenty five percent the dude in that movie because oh, now least. his character is kind of hippie ish, but all throughout that movie, he's saying to his son like. Time to go, man. Hey, dude, let's get out of here. Like he literally says, "Dude," at one point, uh, and he's like describing the coding. At one point, he's like, "Far out, like uh, biochemical jazz." Man. Yeah, yeah. It's very dude. Oh, he's very dudeish in yeah. that. And I, I CGI dig it. to be younger and all that's in right. Some scenes, yeah, right? yeah. And I haven't seen it, and I uh, should because I loved the Daft Punk uh, soundtrack. Oh, I, that. And I a- liked. I spent many years in front of the light cycles, but and I remember the original, but like I didn't. See the new one. Oh, it's so good. Michael Sheen is like oh, a club owner. I would I would definitely recommend it. Yeah. There's a, Michael Sheen is is playing like a Bowie esque character. Okay. In yeah. in the scene that features Daft Punk actually the in son the son of a maker. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I love that movie so much. It's not great. That scene in particular is one of the most fun things I've, I've it ever absolutely seen. is from start to finish. That whole scene is the, the best thing in the movie. If there was a way to re release Tron Legacy, like i I mean, somehow I, I I don't know what I'm actually even proposing here. <laughs> I but, don't either. But, but there's, it's got a huge following. It now. does. In fact, I almost never hear anybody say anything but, but good things about it. Mm-hmm. And I know that the director wanted, wants to make a third. This is the guy that made Oblivion, Kaczynski. Yeah, yeah, Kaczynski. Yeah, yeah. And that the stars have, Olivia Wilde has been pretty vocal about wanting to make another one. And I think eventually it'll get there. Maybe it needs some kind of Deadpool leak type event to trigger some kind of a fan movement. Right. What happened with her? How did she. S- I don't want to spoil it. No, don't, don't, wor- don't worry about it. I, I still haven't seen it. Don't worry about it. Okay, well, I've got a question then. <laughs> like, what happened with the Olivia Wilde character? How does she get out of that game? They, they just say, they say very early on that what um, <clears throat> the bad guy's trying to do is get out. He figures if... Clue. Yes. Yeah. He figures if Flynn could go from the real world into this one, then the reverse is true. Mm-hmm. And the son is like... <laughs> and then Jeff Bridges is like... Is Jeff Bridges? Jeff Bridges yeah, is like, yeah. no, it's theoretically possible. That's, That's the it. portal, right? Yeah. She just goes through the portal with him and go- she goes into the human world. And he's still there. The old Jeff Bridges, the the dude, is still there, right? In the game. Because he created a world or something, right? Like it's, He, he lives did. there and he's like the king, he's king shit. He is. And he like stays there and... That's, that's, he what got I, that's ousted. all I gathered from the trailer. I have no idea. He got ousted at the end of the 1984 Tron by Clue, his double, right? And Clue right. stays the same I haven't the seen the age. original since I was 10. Yeah, yeah. And in the Tron Legacy, Clue has now taken over and uh, and Flynn, the, okay. the protagonist, is in exile. Basically. So that's what I'll do. I'll watch the original Tron and then I'll, I'll legacy it up. There you go. <sighs> I mean... And I'll know what's happening. You, there you go. You don't even have to bother with it. <laughs> <laughs> the original, because the original is, is does not. I don't know if your if your event if if it were my event and I was going to imbibe something, you know, the original might be a great. Starter. No, that's true. Yeah. But but the second one is a lot of fun, a surprising amount of fun, and All it's right. gorgeous too. Yeah, it looks slick as hell. Yeah, I can't wait. This uh, this episode is going to be a little out of order because because uh, uh, Matt had to leave, <laughs> uh, and we are we're very happy that he came by. He was very engaging and awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but uh, we're going to continue with our recommends and warns. So you're going to hear him not be in this segment, <laughs> and then he's going to show up mysteriously at the end somehow. Yeah. Uh, so he's not in the room when we go into this, but uh, at our in our last thing, he he will mysteriously show back up, and that's the reason. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you have another uh, warning, Rekka? Rekka what? Um. Yeah. It's, and guys, I I watch a lot of movies where I just don't know what where to land. Mm-hmm. I, I it's it's just the way it is. These movies are weird a lot of times. Uh. I I'm gonna. There's a double feature that I'm going to I'm going to end up recommending because I think different is something that we should always recommend. Mm-hmm. Um. Even if you may not react to it in the right way or whatever. So on movie there was a movie called Sex is Comedy. Oh. Ooh. Did you see this? No, I saw, I think, the second part of your double feature. Fat Girl. No. All right, never mind. I saw an Anatomy of Hell. Okay. Yeah, by the so same, by same, the same, same director. Same director, yeah. yeah. Uh, her name is Catherine Bria. And she ain't scared. Bria. Yeah. Uh, no, she ain't scared is right. Uh, I watched Sexist Comedy first because it was on Mubi, uh, but it is based on her experiences making Fat Girl. And... Um, and so sex is comedy is about 
it's a it's autobiographical essentially it's about the the tr- the trouble she had getting an actor and actress who didn't like each other to have a love scene in a movie i did see this you did see this yes um so the very beginning of it is is her trying to give directions and he's like ah, she doesn't like me at all and and then she's like not into him and she's got a boyfriend and she doesn't want to do nude scenes and well she doesn't want to do a certain amount of nude scene like i think it's like full frontal she doesn't want to do or mm. something um and uh so that so she's dealing with these egos and these emotions of these actors during this whole thing and there's a big moment which is the scene that's in fat girl where uh a guy uh, is uh is going to have sex with her and like it, they want to have everything very meticulous like just barely see his wang when <laughs> when when it comes like i i, I was stunned at that revelation because a lot of times i wonder was that an accident yeah yeah. like when you see certain things in Ooh. movies it was like was that something they just didn't see <laughs> what well, the direction was i want to see like his wang a little bit and then it goes <laughs> away we don't want to focus on it we want to show that it's there <laughs> and uh and so like the the trouble of having of, of of trying to get these people through an emotional scene and everything and so like it builds up to this whole thing where they have to like stop shooting and have to go into rooms and like <laughs> talk it out and all this and then finally she just ends up having to go over and just like get her into this emotional state to mm. finally be like all right now you're ready fascinating movie i wouldn't say it's the greatest movie in the world you're not going to be excited by this you're not going to be sitting there going oh what a bang up great ass movie that was but to know that that was something that was going that was an actual thing uh, that the director of this movie went through Mm -hmm. and then ended up making a movie based on that that's fascinating to me it's a cool movie about making movies yeah and it's it's not as you know ethereal and uh you know funny and acerbic is uh living the, in oblivion living in oblivion which is a movie that you will think about a million times yes, you will. while you watch this because there are a lot of that same type of mm. not not humor but right. the same type of oh my god headaches yeah. that happen in all this uh i was very interested to know what this movie was that they were making and the movie was called fat girl uh and uh it's about this these two sisters one is one is uh yes a bigger girl she's uh she's younger than this one her sister who is just gorgeous this uh this girl is called, what's her name her name is roxanne mesquita mm. uh she is absolutely just drop dead gorgeous um but she they hang out and everything and then she finds she they're on vacation and her sister uh sort of uh meets this guy and then they just start have just staying, hanging out while their family is on vacation and they have to sneak around and everything. And she's a virgin. Uh, and so like, uh, they're, they're still trying to find a way though, to sort of like make out and stuff without the parents knowing. And so there's a big scene in this, which is the, the thing about that sex is comedy is made on where the guy comes up through the window and he's basically sitting there just trying to convince this girl to have sex with him the entire time while the sister is over in the other side they think she's asleep she's not and uh and uh so they're having this big conversation you don't even know she's in there for a really long time like this conversation goes on for a really really long time uh and uh they're just like oh she's asleep or whatever and then they you show they show her and she's kind of got like she's like got her eyes shut but like she'll she poke her eyes poke open and everything um and then the guy is like uh well i know one thing that girls will do that so they can still have their virginity and everything Mm. and so that happens take it up the nose take it up the nose (laughs) everybody's having nose sex (laughs) and uh and so like uh the sister is obviously uh traumatized a little bit i don't think i wouldn't say that she's like just completely like (laughs) just uh blubber afterwards or anything but uh you know not it's not something that a girl of that age should be witness to mm. um and uh and uh and then so what's interesting about this movie though is the fucking hard right turn it takes towards the end hmm. and uh it is fucking shocking hmm, really 
Yeah. I'm not saying it's shocking in a bad way either. Like after telling you the sort of the setup, you might think, Oh God, what the hell happens? But it's a, it's a shocking, shocking turn. Like it, it's, uh, I've often thought about movies, uh, that have this certain, certain way about it. Like this red, like the red eye trailer, but in movie form. Okay. Where, it seems to be going along this sort of the, okay, two thirds of it is like, okay, everything's predictable. And then third act, just fuck it. We just going to turn it up to 11. We're going to just change this completely around. And that's what fat girl does. Hmm. And so I recommend that movie too, just based on, and now that, and fat girl's a better movie than sex is comedy, mm. but it's, uh, I would recommend it just based on that, but it inherently, these are wreck of warns. All right uh because they're not for everybody yeah you'll have you'll have a pretty good time with sexist comedy i and uh if it's in a similar vein as fat girl i'm i'm looking forward to watching that mm -hmm. yeah yeah i was just gonna say i'd like to point out that uh, movie d is not sponsoring this episode of the podcast yeah. but we're still talking about them that's right because <laughs> yeah. that's how much we love them yeah oh yeah um so I have three, and I'm on the edge. Honestly, There Will Be Blood was at the bottom of my list, but I thought we might fight, so I bumped it up. Because um, I've been watching a lot of mainstream movies lately. Like I have this kind of reputation of pulling up something obscure out of my ass for the recommender one. But these are all mainstream. So I wanted to, at first I was going to talk about The Favorite, because my wife and I are 0 for 2 lately. We, we put in The Favorite, uh -huh. sat down to watch it, and did not enjoy it. Um, didn't hate it. Performances are good. Mm -hmm. um, I don't need your anachronistic bullshit. Sorry. <laughs> That's not even the movie I want to warn. All right. You love it. Yes. I see art. Didn't like it. All right. All right. But what I really want to talk about is the next movie my wife and I put into watch recently that we hated, and that's the Mary Poppins Returns sequel. Oh, God. <laughs> and we have in this. this. Yep. She does a pretty good Mary Poppins voice. All right. I'm out of compliments. Mm. What? Uh, what's the deal with this? Is this another uh, kids forget that uh, they had an experience but they have to be reminded it about is, their childhood. it is in, it is in that like because okay so jane and michael banks have grown up mm -hmm. um michael's wife just died hey because we needed some emotional button pressing go. he's got three kids and uh his sister jane comes over to help take care of he's out of money he's about to lose his house mm -hmm. still works at the bank but seems like a pretty decent father obviously it's time for mary poppins yep yep my point by the way is that Mary Poppins is not needed. Uh, Mary Poppins arrives and turns him into a worse father than he was before she showed up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All because she has an agenda. So Mary Poppins shows up. She's like, well, you're busy. You're out of money. You need a nanny. I'll take care of the kids. And he's like, oh, I remember Mary Poppins. But none of that magic shit happened, right? I don't know how they work this out, right? So then fucking all it comes down to is this piece of paper. He's got shares in the bank. Uh -huh. He owns shares in the bank. Bank, evil Colin Firth is trying to steal his house because that's what you do. <laughs> when you when you need a villain, he's trying to take people's houses. Yep. For no reason. He's a gazillionaire. Mm -hmm. Doesn't need that house. Got thousands of houses he's already repossessed, but he is laser focused on taking Michael Banks' house. Michael Banks can save his house if he can find the certificate of stock of mm -hmm. shares in the bank. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, his stupid ass kid... Well, first of all, unfortunately, he drew a doodle on the back of it a long time ago, and it got stored as a doodle instead of an important document. Then his kid takes a doodle paper, cuts it up, and uses it to patch up a flying kite. <laughs> Mary Poppins is watching all of this. She actually tells the kid, go in that room and tidy up those papers so that he'll find the drawing and then have it on him when they find the kite that needs patching. Oh, we use this. She basically guides the whole fucking thing. All right. Why is this making you so angry, though? Because it's infuriating. <laughs> First of all, it's the, have you seen it? I have not. It's the same fucking movie. It sounds exactly like every Mary single Poppins. beat, like because uh, Lin Manuel Miranda is, is playing Dick Van Dyke's character instead of a chimney sweep, he's a lamplighter. He's actually in it, right? Yeah, yeah. he's still a sooty street worker. Mm -hmm. He shows up, street and along with Mary Poppins and the kids, they jump into a painting uh -huh. and have a twenty-five minute LSD induced. Nice adventure mm -hmm. with cartoon animals. Mm -hmm. It's the same fucking movie. Wow. And Mary Poppins knows where the stock certificate is from five minutes into showing up in the movie. She could just say, Michael, there's your paper. Go save your house. Instead, the stress of not finding it causes him to yell at his children several times. Enough. Shut up. Turning him into a bad father. It's almost yeah. like she's not real. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think people are going to twist that to to make that like you're being a dick to me right now. <laughs> no, no, no. They, I think I, I understand what you're saying. I, to me, it sounds like like if I were to watch this movie and by the end of the movie find out that she's not real, I would. It would make all that stuff that you said would make more sense. Exactly. But she is real in the movie. In the movie, she's yeah. real. And and um, I was saying like you you were you were saying it's almost as this is a movie and she's a fictional character. Yeah, yeah, but that's yeah, not what you were saying. Yeah. So then at the very end, literally five minutes to midnight, um, the dad picks up the kite because they've packed up their house and they're moving because they're going to lose their house now and sees through the drawing that he's holding up to the light that Lin-Manuel Miranda lit, sees the document, a certificate of stock on the back. Mm -hmm. And now they're going to be able to save the day. All right. It's just, it's just a bunch of bullshit drama created because <laughs> Mary Poppins wanted to push pieces around a chessboard. Mm -hmm. And then they decide they have to turn back time. This is a movie about magic. So to turn back time, how does Mary Poppins do that? Oh, I think I she think flies I know. up to Big Ben and literally pulls the hand back a little bit. <laughs> this movie infuriated me. I have a very good friend who loved it. His name is Dicer. Yeah. <laughs> it actually it's, sounds kind of delightful. It, sound, it sounds like. <laughs> I have not done my job. <laughs> it sounds like that Big Ben moment. It sounds like any asshole could walk up to the top of the Big Ben and yes, in fact, turn the what hand. happens before that is Mary Poppins lets Lin Manuel and the rest of the Learys. Those that's the name of the guys who go around Britain turning on and off the streetlights <laughs> that are not chimney sweeps, right? Right, they're not chimney sweeps. <laughs> they're Larrys. That they all stack their ladders. And like pile climb to the top of Big Ben, mm -hmm. and then somebody goes, "Hey, well, what? What's your idea? Well, how are we going to turn back to? They don't even fucking know. <laughs> well, and they're like, well, we're helpless. And then Mary Poppins is like, fine, I'll do it myself, and floats up there and pulls that fucking and, bitch. And if you, you know, and if you could do that, and if you could do that, <laughs> why don't you just go back in time and kill Hitler? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> no, no, just right here. Yeah, like I, well, you know, you know, I want to adhere to the time travel rules and shit. Don't want to meet myself or something, you know. And you know, oh my god, like I know that I have experiences more than normal people because of the sins videos that movies might make me angrier than they might make someone else. And I know in general this movie made a lot of money and people seemed delighted. You by know, it. I don't think it made as much as they were hoping it would. Really? Yeah, I mean, well, let me look at it real quick, but I don't think it made I can't believe this movie made you so bad. I mean, it's it's not Pete's Dragon bad. <laughs> but it got to a point because the way that they shoot the movie, I'm just going to go ahead and spoil the fact that we have a sins video coming this week for this uh, the week that you're hearing this mm. because I have to talk about the sin I'm about to write. I wrote a sin about how, okay, so they shoot the certificate when the kid takes the drawing, put away the papers, the way the camera shoots the thing. I wrote a sin that said, okay, I know the stock certificate is on the back of this drawing. Mm -hmm. What I don't know is if the movie wants me to know, like, is it trying to tip its hand or is it trying to, like, be sneaky with foreshadowing it can claim later I didn't notice? Ah. But, like, she fucking knows from moment one. She knows. Like, like at least in the first movie, the parents were bad. They were they, had, yeah. they were distant from their kids, and she helped heal a family unit. Mm -hmm. She doesn't do that here. <laughs> He's a good father. There's, there's, this the, guy is a good father. <laughs> the pressure. <laughs> Children are not leveraged. <laughs> His wife died, and he needs money. Yeah. He doesn't need to learn to be a better father. <laughs> and she shows up and keeps him from the money and makes him a worse father. Uh, uh, all right. Maybe it's not delight. What a dick. I really, really, really. Who plays Michael like. Banks? Who plays Michael Banks? The guy from um, <laughs> Cloud Atlas who writes the music. The pianist. Uh, I can't ben Wishaw? Maybe. Yeah, Ben something. Ben Wishaw. He's, He's great. Uh, by the way, Mary Poppins Returns made 170 domestic. Hmm. And a roughly that much worldwide, and so it, at a production budget of 130 million, they definitely thought they'd make more. They, especially a crit, it came out like on Christmas. It, that's right? the thing for me. If you come out with a movie on December 19th, which is the classic Titanic, Avatar, Star Wars uh, release date. You should, and you have a movie that you really believe in. It should have made way more than that. Yeah, and there was no competition either around that. And then you know, I need to. I only have the one viewing, so I need to go back to the songs and see if any have real staying power. Um, I didn't feel like they did. Hmm. Um, but and there's even some like 
oddly inappropriate sexual innuendo in the song they do while they're in the painting. It's actually painting on the side of a bowl, but I don't think that matters. Um, <clears throat> but there's like some, there's like some wink, wink. Is he talking about penises? Kind of humor. Oh, in there. nice. Um, and I don't know. The whole thing just, I, th- I, I think what happens is if I get turned off early enough in the sin writing process, like I start looking for shit to hate. <laughs> and once it became clear that she wasn't actually there to heal any family dynamic, and that she had the thing they needed all along, and she's just playing wuzzle wuzzle with all the <laughs> wuzzle wuzzle. <laughs> just, I just lo- I just it made me mad, man. Yeah, <laughs> have a reason. It was pretty clear reading that script. That's the way that that, that was going. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ben, ben Wishaw was in a movie called Perfume: The Story of a Murderer, mm. which I often confuse with the Young Poisoners hand- Handbook. Uh, uh, that's about. Uh, is Nicole Kidman in that? Not that I see. Or maybe she's in. She's in Fur. Yeah. <laughs> but uh ben weshaw plays jean baptiste grenier there you go uh but uh i'm totally butchering the french uh ass stuff no, I'm, I'm i'm sorry french people who listen to our show that's right i saw an episode of friends yesterday really <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. do so tell <laughs> monica's trying to recreate phoebe's grandma's famous cookie recipe mm-hmm. she bakes batch after batch after batch trying to get it to taste exactly like phoebe's grandmother and then finally at the end phoebe says the name of her grandmother and it's Nestle Toulouse. <laughs> <laughs> and Monica's, Nestle Toll House! <laughs> and then she says, you Americans always butcher the French language. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Of course. I can just see her saying that. Do you have a recommend or a warn? I've got a warn. And this is a weird warn because I really wanted to like this movie. Is Mary Poppins Returns? No, it's The Miseducation of Cameron Post. Oh, I saw that movie. Yeah, what'd you think? I thought, you know what, it... This this kind of movie needs to go hard into edgy indie comedy or drama. And this movie yes. doesn't do either. No. You're absolutely right. Yeah. This is a great message, but it's a bad movie. Yeah. It's a bad movie because it, it pulls its punches. There's no actual stakes. It's so weird. So Chloe Grace Moritz plays a, a young woman who is a lesbian and who falls in love with her best friend and starts you know, a sexual relationship with them, uh, even though they're supposed to be going to prom and having boyfriends. Have you seen this? No. Um, and having boyfriends and all that stuff. And uh, she gets caught having a sexual encounter in the backseat of the, the car at prom by her boyfriend, I think. Mm. Um, and when her stepfather finds out about it, uh, I believe it's her stepfather that's religious. Her mom is not. He recommends that his that her mom sends her to this gay conversion camp. God's promise. And this is where it loses me mm-hmm. because you're absolutely right. It could go. It, it's very much like that movie Saved. Yeah. Mm. Um, mm. But that movie's funny and it's well, acerbic. Uh, you, you, uh, it could have gone Girl Interrupted. Yep. It could have gone Saved. Mm-hmm. It tries to do both. It tries to. It, there's a couple characters she meets at God's Promise that are there for laughs, that are there for comedy's sake. But it tries to have moments of serious weighty drama and uh, it all kind of i thought she was really good chloe grace i thought she was spectacular and god she's gonna have like a, a legendary career i think do you think this is a i'm glad you brought this up because that was what my contribution to this conversation was going to be since i haven't seen the movie i'm not certain at this point oh really i i think she's definitely trying but it feels like dakota fanning right now mm. uh where dakota fanning definitely she could retire now mm. and it would be fine but she hasn't quite broken through like she hasn't quite gotten that thing yet that makes her uh you know everybody knows the name of chloe grace moretz you know it's not like yeah i i i feel like she's got like an emma stone type of i want her to and i want i want dakota fanning to be both of them because they're both extremely talented but i haven't yet and they they seem to be trying they're Mm -hmm. getting these movies like miss education to camera but uh she's also been in like 10 horror remakes yeah and uh and you're not even kidding like no i'm not kidding like that's 10, not right? it's not exaggerating yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean if it's if if it's not 10 it's at least it's, eight or nine yeah it's around there we're yeah. talking about chloe grace mm-hmm. yeah so i i've seen let the right one in or let me in mm-hmm. yep what else has she been in that i missed oh she was in carrie carrie mm-hmm. she was in suspiria oh you're, right. uh, oh you're right i can go down this hole no list. you don't have to no i will because it's 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 interesting when you look at how many times she's been in horror remakes uh, uh dark shadows 
Oh, wow. Um, and she was obviously in Amityville Horror. That was one of her first ones. Oh, yeah. Um, the Eye. Oh, wow. Um, oh, that's already more than I actually thought you were going to find. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot. Um, Amityville Horror. Yeah, so those were the ones. I mean, it may not be. It's somewhere up there around There's, six, seven. Uh, given her age, I mean, was she 21? She's 21 like years that? old. Um, and like you said, she's really, really good in this. And the reason that I say I think she's going to have a really, really good emma stone type of career is that she s- saves this from just being a trash movie yeah you know and uh if she starts making i don't know not that she needs my advice but if she st- starts making decisions like emma stone did mm-hmm. besides aloha you know she has an aloha but she's also got a la la land mm-hmm. you know so uh you know i think i think she has the chops to do it you know just as well um but overall this movie it ends like just bizarrely gruesomely mm. and it's it's just and i'll spoil it Do at it. the end of it they leave the camp mm-hmm. they run away mm-hmm. and it's fucking as it it, it, it takes it, them walking off of the property that's it mm-hmm. and then they could have done that every time martha marcy may marlene that's true mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh no she goes she leaves with her two friends it's basically meeting the mean girls people but they literally walk off the property mm-hmm. that's how that that's how low the stakes are in mm-hmm. this entire fucking movie mm-hmm. and have some stakes or have some comedy. What I need it to do... Have, have either of you seen the one, the gay conversion camp movie with the kid from Manchester by the Sea? Boy Erased? Boy Erased. I have not. I'd like to see that. That's compare, what I want to see. Yeah. Because I, I remember reading reviews of that that sounded like it like it treated it a little more dramatically. Mm-hmm. Um, which, again, that kid's a great actor. So, But she was great. She's okay. It wasn't a terrible movie. It was just kind of blah. Yeah. I was, I was really... I was looking forward to it because it, it looked like it was a good um, message, like I said. And Desiree Akavan is the uh, the director, the prisoner of Akavan. The, yes, <laughs> Desiree <laughs> of Akavan. <laughs> she probably gets that a million times. I'm sure she it's does. It's not an original joke to her. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so you don't you don't need to you know, go watch Superior again. All right. If you haven't watched the Superior, I haven't Suspiria. watched. Suspiria. Yeah, that's watch definitely Suspiria. not a Jeremy movie. No. Holy, oh, I want to watch that. It's in my stack, right but it's not moving up. Well, things I, are jumping ahead I will say that, uh, you know, uh, Dakota Johnson is worth watching that movie for. Oh, yeah. She's pretty. She's a good actress. But yeah, she uh, just a little bit. Just a little just bit. A little uh, bit. Yeah, I don't know. But uh, it's, it more, it's, like more, a... it's more about her performance in this one. Isn't it? I've always thought that she was, like I've said this before, I've always thought that she was good, but she was always in stuff like Fifty Shades. And, uh, and now she has a movie where she actually can show how good she is. Mm. Mm. And yeah, I, unfortunately, if you want to see that, you'd have to watch Suspiria, which I love. But I love the part in Social Network. The scene that she's in is so funny to me because there's so many little conversational sorkinisms, little quirks. Because like he's in the bed and she doesn't think he remembers anything about her, and then he proves that he does, and then he's like, "Aha! Now the shoe is on the other." And she's like, "Foot?" And he's like, "Table," which is turned. <laughs> <laughs> and then when he calls her out to ask about Facebook, and she says, "There's a snake in here." She runs out. And he's like, "Okay, there's not a snake." And she's like, "I could have died." And he's like, "How could you have died?" <laughs> Still having these side conversations the whole time. It's really funny. One right. thing we need to address is Charlie Charlie Theron saying that she wants a boyfriend. Oh yeah. Well, she didn't just say that. Like, she put it out there. Yeah, well, and I don't, I, I don't get here, that. Here's, here's my question. Do you think that she put it out there, hoping someone in particular would get that kind of uh, vibe, or just everybody in the world, and she has her choice? Like it's maybe it's just a joke. It could, it could have just be a joke. been a joke. Yeah. But I also feel like there's a, I remember Jennifer Lawrence saying something similar. This was several years ago about mm. how it doesn't seem like, like, it seems like a lot of guys are afraid to ask her out. I imagine Charlize Theron is probably in that boat. If you're George Clooney and you're not married, you probably don't have any problem talking to Charlize Theron. Mm-hmm. But she's not constantly hanging out with A-list male celebrities who are single. That's true. And so most people probably... I just got the sense because I was reading the tw- the the twitters and everybody were like, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, hey, Charlie's, uh, if you ever want to go out on a date with me, I'm totally down. And I'm like, that's not exactly the attention that I think she's looking for. <laughs> no, like, I like the idea though that there's one particular person, like maybe they have flirted with having a relationship but he hasn't made the move yet and sh- this is like her sending a signal to him i feel I like that's awesome. gotta be like directed towards like some very specific people because i don't i don't I, Shirley's theron doesn't know what kind of like uh, 
Pandora's box she's opening. <laughs> well, seriously. I mean, she can obviously ignore most of it, but, uh, you know, that's going to be everybody who ever runs into her that's seen that article is going to start being like, oh, I've got the balls. I think, I think it's, it, it may be a joke because she goes on to say, like, I've been single for 10 years and she clearly hasn't been ten, single for 10 years. Yeah. She's got two kids under 10. She's, well, I, she adopted those kids. Did she adopt them? I think she adopted those but kids. The article goes on to say that she was very publicly in relationships with this guy. Yeah, she was ago. with uh, Stuart was... Townsend at yeah, one time. Yeah. And she then... was with the lead singer of some, it's not Semisonic, uh, three, Third Eye Blind. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> didn't she? Mr. Tone They're all the same. <laughs> didn't she have a brief Sean Penn thing, too? Everybody did. <laughs> yeah. I think everybody did. <laughs> everybody did. Well, Scarlett Johansson did. Oh, did. another one I watched recently that I wanted to talk to you about was Into the Wild. Oh yeah, because I know you. Like, one of you guys digs on that movie. Yeah, I do. Chris does. I, yeah. I like it. I didn't hate it. I really didn't. Mm-hmm. I just thought it was good. I didn't think it was great. I, um, I, I read think, the book though. See, and that's the. Pro- I think part of the problem for me is that it takes a book to connect to that character mm-hmm. and his on screen. It feels like such a he's a dick greeting card philosophy of life to just leave everything behind. Mm-hmm. It just seems so like, now, hollow. That was the first movie that I knew Kristen Stewart could act. Yep. She's great. Um, and uh, uh, it is kind of weird, though. He's what? How old is he in that movie? But Kristen Stewart is like 15. Yeah, he turns her down because she's too young. He, does, is that what happens? Yeah. Okay, I, I thought he turned her down because he didn't want to have her uh, ruin his trip to Alaska. Well, that or, was part of it. But like, she strips down to her underwear right. and lays in the bed. And he's like, how old are you? And she's yeah. like... 16 and he's like uh, and she's like okay i'm 15 and he's like yeah are you saying Kristen right. stewart herself was around yes, 15 so yes. that was around they, and, 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 room, and, I guess. and in the movie in the movie itself she's 15 she's I playing see. of her age and uh it was weird because everybody in that camp that he's at is like yeah go for it yeah and i'm like uh, that's the one part of the movie i don't like uh how holbrook is awesome though but even that camp is like that their philosophy is the same as his they just have a camp yeah. 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 <laughs> I just I like anyway, I I think I should read the book. Krakauer's writing is excellent mm-hmm. and I've liked everything I've read from him, um but I I didn't really super connect to that movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh it's one of those things where it actually sort of gives a I I don't know if he's got the dead on explanation that everybody agrees with as to what happened to him, but the book I think this the movie also uh goes along with this is that uh, he crosses a river that's that's raging at the time, but he doesn't. I mean, you no, know, it's frozen at mm. the time, and he doesn't know that. Uh, come like a month or so later, it's going to be a raging river at that point. And uh, when he comes back, he's stuck behind this thing. He can't cross it for you know however many months, and yeah. so that's why he ends up getting. But stuck. Sean Penn directed that, right? Yeah, that's why I made that connection. In case yeah. I was curious, I didn't just jump to a yeah, 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 another you. you know. Yeah. All right. Well, that'll do it for uh, this week. Uh, keep going to Sincast presented by Cinema Sins uh, on Facebook. Uh, we have a Cinema Sins Twitter. We have uh, Reddit, uh, Patreon. Uh, what else is there? There's a Discord. Yeah. There's Twitter. Uh, there's everywhere. Uh, uh, watch uh, Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yes. yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's so good. Right. Matt Mahaffey has some great music on that that uh, you want to listen to. You want to listen to all the self to. And, uh, you know, just. Uh, Thank, you so, yeah, Thank you so much. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but uh, that'll do it for this week. It's Chris Atkins and Jeremy Scott and Barrett Share and Matt Mahaffey. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. And be sure to visit cinemasins.com. I went through, we went through all these permutations of microphones and stuff like that. We started off, I was actually in Chicago. We started the podcast, like doing a remote thing. It probably sounds like shit over, you know, if you've listened to it back Listen in back. the day. Yeah. Uh, but then we, we built this out and everything. And then we kept like kind of tinkering and tinkering and actually went over to NPR uh, to their studios and open house. You know, house Jason Moon Wilkins? Met Jason Moon Wilkins over there. Yeah. Known him for years. Did you, really? I listen to him every morning. He's yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it, it's weird to hear his 
speaking voice versus his radio voice, you know? What mic is he using? He's using the RE20s. All is NPR okay. uses RE20s that I know of. Mm -hmm. And so we tested them out, and it just didn't work for our voices, so we went right. with the 320s. Oh, interesting. Mm, crazy. Isn't that a crazy story, Jim? Somebody Jay? out there. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Somebody out there is going to really, I'm not even joking, really dig that, like, deep audio like oh, yeah, jargon man. discussion well the, the, it's not me but someone is the depth lies in the fact that you all had the same sibilance that it was like <laughs> this mic universally captures our emotions that's right We've, we're all in the same cycle microphones yes. are, microphones are weird um you know it could be the most expensive most used vocal mic and if i you know if i'm making a record and i'm singing you know i have a very lispy voice like mm. my s's are really you know, mm -hmm. so I um I have to use different mics than normal people. Like I mean, there are universal mics. I'm just like that. Just sounds good on everything. But for me personally, it'll mm -hmm. make me sound really thin or really. I don't like really bright yeah, vo yeah. vocals. Yeah, yeah. So um if I if I'm I'll cook with whatever's in the kitchen. But like <laughs> uh some I just have to roll off a lot of high end. You know. Yeah. But it's your your studio. You have it all. I've got, I've got my stuff. chains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> I think we look pretty good. Okay. Uh, I mean, we all look good. I right. Mean, yeah. Damn. Right. <laughs> You're talking about our peaks and valleys. Matt definitely looks good. You look. You, you look nice. No, this is beautiful. Just you guys, just chilling in here, just surrounded by YouTube awards. Oh <laughs> my god. Well, <laughs> feel really like Game of Thronesy. Like, <laughs> you know. Wow, you got the history, man. Yeah. Well, the Franklin, the Franklin Theater. There was a studio that I did a lot of the self records at. It was called the Bennett House, mm -hmm. and it was basically stone's throw from from that place so we would record all day and you'd stay there so it was like a b and airbnb upstairs so you just stay oh, really? there. yeah awesome. you stay there it was like a big old <laughs> antebellum house nice and with a giant studio in it and um so at night we would walk over to that theater and it was just couches and beer like they yeah. had beer and it was just like this is the greatest thing <laughs> oh, ever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Life, man. oh yeah <laughs> and now you can only do that in like i mean i, I guess you, you, know, you can get beer at uh I'm at. You can get it that at Opry Mills and stuff now. But like the the Austin Theater is it the Grind House, oh, the Draft yeah, House, yeah, the Draft House, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alamo Draft House. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a chain now, I guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But just that whole thing of like, yeah, you got a little tray and you can eat and you can just be dick and <laughs> yeah, whatever. like chewing on ribs while you're watching, yeah, yeah. smacking, <laughs> yeah. smacking on some meat, ribs. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and childish Gambino's "This Is America." How did it sound? pretty damn good really if i could find a third song because the way she does do you know both those songs decent yeah but in bury a friend i don't know what she says but she does that what do you want from me oh i see and it's, this Where is america this is america yeah, yeah, yeah. but because it's the same beats per minute um and a lot of songs in that beat per minute it's 120 is are rock songs and so i gave up when i couldn't find like a third Anything I'll, I'll that give, kind of I'll, had a. By the time I get home, I'll give you a third. Because song. he has that breakdown, that choral Jamaican oh, na, breakdown. Na, 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 yeah. Na, na, na. Um, and so it, it ends up blending pretty well. Nice. Anyway, I you know I could put it on YouTube and get a strike, but it was it was fun to tinker with. <laughs> Fuck yeah, man. <laughs> I gotta cut that. He. <laughs>